Welcome to Hot Chips 29. Session 9, Server. Okay, let me uh, welcome everyone to the final, last session of Hot Chips. Uh, I'm Alan Smith from UC Berkeley. I'm your session chairman. Um, the, you notice this is, well, it's called the server session. This is the big iron, high performance chips. It takes us back to the f days when Hot Chips began, when, the, uh, when it was really oriented around high performance microprocessors. And the theory is that by having the hottest and most highest power per chips at the end, everyone will stick around. Um, that theory is only 50% uh, successful. Um, anyway, so our first speaker today is going to talk about the next generation IBM Z systems processor. Uh, most of you guys don't see mainframes these days, but they really are out there, and they're really fast. And there are a lot of people who are still using them. Um, so our speaker is Christian Jacoby. Uh, the names on the talk are Christian Jacoby and Anthony Saperito. Uh, Dr. Jacoby has a master's and a PhD in latter in 2002 from the Saarland University in Germany uh, with his PhD in formal verification of floating point units. He's been with IBM since 2002, initially in Boblingen, Germany, then three years in Poughkeepsie, then back to Germany, and since 2002, back in Poughkeepsie. He started in logic design for floating point units, then became the unit lead for L2 and L1 caches. And for the ZEC12, which is a, a Z systems processor, he was a lead act architect for transactional memory, which was the first uh, transactional memory implementation in a commercial CPU. He was core design lead for the Z14 and is now overall chief architect for future generation mainframe processor cores and cache. Uh, Christian? Thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to the last session of Hot Chips. Um, I'll be talking about the uh, microprocessor and a little bit about the system that we just announced a few weeks ago, the Z14 system. Um, I don't assume that everybody knows what a mainframe is, but um, as uh, Alan just said, there's a um, lot of mainframes still out there. I only use this one chart uh, as a marketing chart to kind of describe what we're even talking about. Um, mainframes are used in, in many large, medium and large corporations as their hub for their transactional data. Uh, so we process a lot of transactions, financial transactions, other transactions, when you run a credit card, there's a mainframe involved, very likely. Um, more than 90% of, of the largest retailers and airlines um, are using mainframe, like booking systems on, on airlines and things like that. Um, so they are very fundamental to IT in, in commercial in, in the enterprise world. Uh, they run large databases, large transaction systems, etc. We also run large Linux installations, uh, highly virtualized uh, Linux systems. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about the implications of designing for that scope of, of workload um, and how we make design decisions uh, tailored to, to those workloads. Um, the Z14 processor is the fifth generation processor um, in, um, since Z10 came out in um, 2008. Uh, we went to high frequency design back in Z10. Um, added out of order in uh, Z196, uh, transactional memory in, in EC12, SMT in Z13. Uh, and I'll now talk um, about some of the features of the latest uh, machine here, the, the Z14. Um, I'm actually talk, I'll actually talk a little bit about two chips, not just one chip. Um, the um, mainframe uses um, in its chipset two different chips, the CP chip, which contains uh, the cores and the shared L3 cache, and then the system control chip, 
uh, which contains a large L4 as well as uh, interconnect um, logic to, to hook up um, larger systems. Um, what you see here in the center is a, is a drawer. It's a 24-inch and very deep drawer with, um, with the memory in it, the PCI connections in the front, and you can see six CP chips that can be plugged into that drawer under cold plates. Um, and then there's one SC that also goes into that drawer. Um, the topology in the drawer is shown on the uh, upper left here. So we have two clusters of uh, three CP chips uh, connected to the one SC. And then the blue wires coming out of the SC are cables that we use to interconnect up to four of such drawers. Uh, you see the full system here on the right. Uh, in the right frame, you see four drawers in the center, and then the other drawers that you see in that picture are I.O. drawers. Uh, the CP and SD chip are both very large chips, um, uh, around 700 square millimeters, 17 layers of metal, um, done in 14 nanometer SOI technology. Uh, the CP chip has 10 cores on it. Um, each of these cores has a private a uh, two megabyte iCache level two cache and a four megabyte D uh, level two cache. Uh, and then also on the CP chip is a 128 megabyte um, shared L3. Uh, the SC chip contains 672 megabytes of L4 and like I already mentioned, uh, all the coherency logic. Um, with the connectivity shown here, you can get up to uh, 24 sockets in the system. Um, fairly large system to run, run those kinds of workloads. Um, and as you can already see, it's very cache-heavy, uh, which, which is also uh, uh, a key ingredient for the types of workloads we are running. Uh, the processor design itself, I, I view it as um, three pillars on which we uh, innovated based on the foundation of the Z13. Uh, classical microarchitecture improvements, um, like a completely new translation and TLB design. I'll actually spend a few minutes talking about the details there. Uh, and then just general pipeline optimizations, things like that. Um, there's also a significant number of changes in the instruction set architecture in the middle pillar here. We added a feature called pauseless garbage collection, enabling uh, Java uh, workloads to continue to run while the garbage collector is collecting garbage in the background by the hardware monitoring address conflicts between um, the running workload and what the garbage collector is doing. We've added... Um, uh, instructions for long integer multiply for, uh, for uh, crypto algorithms, RSA and ECC, and things like that. Um, register to register BCD arithmetic. I got a chuckle at lunch um, when I said we are optimizing the processor in particular, not only, but um, one thing that we are um, optimizing for is COBOL performance. Uh, this, yes, yeah, see. <laughs> um, you wouldn't believe how much COBOL is out there. And um, when you run a credit card tonight for dinner, there's likely a COBOL transaction involved. Um, when you book airline tickets, whatever, all the things I mentioned, there's just uh, gazillions of lines of COBOL, and customers require those programs to run ever faster. Um, so that's obviously one thing we continue to focus on. And the uh, BCD arithmetic enhancements we have here are a very, um, very important part of that. And then lastly, um, on the right side, there's the accelerator pillow, uh, pillar. Um, we, we invested heavily in crypto acceleration and also in some compression acceleration, and I'll spend a few minutes talking about that uh, later. Um, this is the pipeline diagram um, of, the, of the processor core. It's a very deep pipeline to support the frequency. Uh, the system runs at uh, 5.2 gigahertz. Um, it's got all the typical ingredients of a, of a deep, out-of-order, superscalar uh, pipeline. Uh, the Z architecture instruction set is a, Z, a CISC architecture, so we need to crack instructions, some of the more complex instructions, into uh, micro-ops. And then the big um, green square is essentially a RISC-style out-of-order pipeline uh, that processes those micro-ops. Um, now, I'll talk a little bit more about um, one of the bigger changes in the processor, which is the uh, uh, directory and TLB pipeline. Uh, traditional uh, cache design on Z and in many other architectures as well uses uh, logical indexed uh, caches, but then uses uh, absolute tech directories. Um, the the uh, 
benefit there is, is, a, is a certain simplicity of the design. And just quickly talking through how this works, you have the address generation logic, let me get the pointer, uh, which, which calculates the, uh, the address, say, for a load instruction. Um, you access the data cache or iCache. You also access a set prediction array, which only does a partial address compare to calculate which of the uh, ways are getting used for the access, and then you return the data to the register file in case of the dcache. And then in parallel, you access the directory and the TLBs. You compare uh, the TLB against the virtual address to obtain the absolute address. Other architectures call that a real address. And then you compare the uh, directory against that. You validate that the set predict was correct. If not, when it, if it was wrong, you reject the instruction and start over. The issue with this design, though, is um, with the associativity of the caches and the associativity of the TLB, it's very area and power inefficient. Um, you access thousands of bit lines, literally, for, um, for each load, because the, uh, the highly associative TLBs and the directories just are wide and need to be accessed for every single load um, time and time again. Um, and it limits the TLB one size, too, uh, of course, we would like to grow the TLB ones more and more um, so they can cover the larger and larger L2 and L3 caches. Otherwise, you take the penalty of a TLB one miss before you can actually go out to the next level cache. Um, and, but by being accessed every single cycle um, for every single load or store instruction um, kind of limits the, uh, our ability there. So we went to a different design point. Uh, we integrated. Uh, well, it's, it's a logically tech directory, which effectively means we've integrated the TLB1 and the L1 cache directory into one structure. Um, we still have the set predict array. The set predict array tells the cache which data to return. We also use the set predict array to, um, pre to load a single directory entry. So the directory is no longer eight way associative wide. Instead, we take those eight um, ways and stack them on top of each other, make a deeper directory, and use the set predict, uh, use the set predict um, uh, as an index into this array, and then compare the single directory entry for whether we have an L1 hit on this. And obviously, with large L1s and, and typical workloads, the uh, L1 hit rates are fairly significant. And so because of that, we save a lot of power and, and don't need to access uh, large structures all the time. Then on a set P miss, when none of the uh, set P entries um, matches, we actually turn to um, a very large, what we call second level TLB for really historical reasons, uh, main TLB now. We also directly power up the L2 directory and the L2 data and have a more traditional um, pipeline here for hit compare uh, on the TLB and the directory. And we compare that against uh, uh, do, so we see whether we have L2 hit or miss, and we can also, with a pointer directory that points back between the L1 and the L2, determine whether a cache line is actually in the L1 already, and we just need to load the translation into the logical directory. With the, benef the benefit of this structure, besides the power, is we can now make the TLB extremely large. Uh, we've got, um, I, I believe, 6,000 uh, entries for 4K pages, and then on the order of, I don't, I, forget the details, I believe 1,500 uh, one Mac pages that we have in the TLB there. Uh, so it's a, it's a very uh, large TLB, which is uh, covering um, the L2 and the L3 uh, cache size very well. Um, with uh, that integrated design point and powering up the, um, the uh, directory and the L2 cache on a set pin node, we can also achieve extremely low latencies. Uh, the four megabyte um, D cache has only an eight cycle load to use latency, uh, which is about uh, 1.5 nanoseconds. So a very, very short pipeline here, large TLB supporting the, the large workloads. Um, I'll talk about the accelerators that we've, that we've um, enhanced on the machine. We've traditionally had crypto accelerators um, uh, on the processor. Uh, what happened is that Data auditing, data encryption, et cetera, became more and more complex, and it's, it's hard for customers to choose which sets of data to encrypt versus which data not to, in, to encrypt, et cetera. So we've taken a different approach and said, let's just make the hardware so fast that it's just simple enough and, 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 and lightweight enough for customers to choose to, to encrypt all of their data. 
Um, so now the uh, IBM Z pervasive encryption design point is it, it's a combination of uh, operating system, firmware, and hardware to enable customers uh, to effectively encrypt all the data going in and out of the mainframe, be it on the network, be it on backup tapes, be it on uh, disk systems. Um, in order to achieve that and enable that, we had to put a significantly faster engine in the processor. Uh, we've redesigned the crypto engines to deliver, um, depending on the exact algorithm, between 4 and 7x the performance of uh, the prior generation Z13. Um, we did this by basically pipelining and running multiple iterations of AES or hash in parallel. Uh, we can execute multiple AES rounds uh, in parallel, and then we actually put multiple of those engines down. Um, we overlap, overlap multiple rounds if the crypto algorithm allows that, depending on whether what blockchaining mode gets used. Uh, you may need to wait for a round of AES to finish before you can start the next round. Uh, but in, most, uh, in the most commonly used um, AES algorithms, you can actually kind of pipeline overlap different AES rounds. Um, that actually made the engine so fast that we then had to redesign the cache interface between the uh, crypto coprocessor co and the caches because we couldn't get the data into the crypto engine fast enough from the caches. So we invented um, new instructions that our firmware layer can use to feed the crypto engine. Uh, these instructions are designed to avoid branches because every time what happened was that the, the crypto engine buffer was full and the firmware took a branch wrong on should I put more data in or not. The pipeline bubble that, created, that got created from that um, sort of stalled the overall bandwidth. So we needed to do things for branch avoidance. Um, and we had to spend a significant effort in prefetching to make sure that the data is actually in the L1 cache uh, when the crypto engine uh, needs to pick it up. Uh, overall, we achieve about 13 gigabytes per second in a single core, and like I said, there's uh, 10 cores on the chip in the specific um, AES uh, XTS test case here. Um, the performance varies slightly with the different uh, modes of AES, but it's always in, in that ballpark. Another thing we added is a new instruction for Galois counter mode encryption, AES GCM. It's a fairly frequently and, and increasingly frequently used um, crypto algorithm that, that does both encryption and um, signature authentication um, of messages. Like, for example, when you use your laptop to connect to your bank, uh, that might very likely use uh, AES GCM. Um, so we have new instructions that support that mode directly. Um, the speed up there consists of using the faster engine that we, that we build, the AES engine as well as the Ghash engine, and then make sure that we operate those two engines that usually are used independently, operate them in concert on the data here uh, to achieve uh, GCM performance at the same level roughly as we have for just AES performance. Uh, that's slightly less. You see the 12.5 gigabytes per second that we've measured um, on, on the machine. Um, Another feature of the, um, of the um, crypto coprocessor is um, key protection. And I'll explain briefly what that means. Obviously, when, when you encrypt data, your encrypted data is only as secure as your key is, right? If your key is readily available for somebody to steal it, then your encrypted data can easily be decrypted uh, by whoever owns the key. Uh, most processors support um, acceleration instructions for AES and things like that. But the way they do that is they typically have the key sitting in the application memory and then perform, for example, SIMD operations or similar things on the data and the key to encrypt the, uh, to encrypt the data. Um, we call that clear key crypto, uh, cryptography because it, the, the key exists in clear in the application memory. Uh, now, the issue with that is that an operating system admin, somebody who has root access, can just steal the key from memory. Or if your application crashes and writes a core dump out to memory or out to disk, the key is potentially in the core dump, right? So you've got exposures there where potentially somebody who's actually not privy to the key can steal the key and, and do harm with that. Um, on the mainframe, we support um, another PCI crypto accelerator, which is the Crypto Express card. It's a PCI card that has a temper responding uh, mechanism. It's, it's essentially a chip with, with, with a memory, and there's a, a temper detection foil over that chip. And if you, somebody tries to take a scope or, or something to get to the data on that chip, uh, the card detects that and essentially erases itself. 
And we use that feature to, to uh, improve on the key issue that I just meant on the main processor itself. We have something that's called protected key cryptography, where a key gets generated, um, for example, for an SSL connection on the crypto card itself, and then gets wrapped in a master key and is returned to the application as a so-called key token. So the application actually never sees the actual key. It only sees the wrapped key. Um, and then when you call a crypto instruction, the coprocessor hardware that I just mentioned, where we have the faster AES engines, et cetera, coordinates with the PCI card to unwrap that key, put that key into a temporary, non-customer accessible storage location, then performs the crypto operation, and then throws the key away. So that essentially you can never, even if you core dump or an operating system administrator dumps your memory or something, you will never find the actual key. You'll only find the key token, which has been wrapped uh, in, the, um, in the master key, which itself then resides in the, the temper resistant uh, PCI card. Um, another thing that we, that we do as a coprocessor accelerator uh, with every core is data compression. Now, this isn't data compression in the sense of GSIP. It's actually um, a dictionary-based compression accelerator that focuses on um, compressing small, relatively small rows of data. Think you're compressing each row in a database individually. And because there's not, redundant, not enough redundancy within each row to do something like GSIP, it uses a dictionary to, to um, reduce the um, entropy. Um, the, the obvious benefit of doing that is the reduced disk cost for storing those very large databases, but it also has secondary effects like reduced bandwidth need between the disk system and the memory, as well as improved efficiency of the uh, database buffer pools, for example, that sit in main memory. Um, we added a feature to this uh, compression algorithm, a new instruction set level um, feature, which is Huffman coding, which is the second step of uh, essentially run length encoding to provide a better compression ratio and, and uh, further reduce the disk cost associated with uh, storing those databases. Um, a second feature we are added, uh, we, and, and oh, by the way, I should mention, so on, a, on, a, on, a, on, a, on an example set of, of uh, uh, DB2 data sets, uh, some of the extreme ones could actually get, you know, close, well, or some, sometimes above 80% additional compression ratio from Huffman encoding. On the ones that are less extreme, we saw an average of 26% uh, percent, uh, compression ratio improvement. So that, that's a very significant um, uh, improvement in data efficiency. Um, a second thing we added is order-free serving compression. It's a new feature that we now have. Um, order preserve and compression is a compression algorithm. It takes your data A uh, and compresses it in a way that you can continue to compare A against other data. So A is less than B exactly if the compressed A is less than the compressed B. Uh, it maintains the ordering relationship of two elements uh, under the compression algorithm. The significance of that is in databases where you have search structures like B trees, um, index trees that are out on disk, um, you don't really want to use um, a compression algorithm, even one that's on each, on each key, as you traverse through a tree, because then you would have to decompress every element along the tree and then compare it against the search tree, um, uh, the search key, I'm sorry. Um, now, this compress, uh, compression algorithm here that's order preserving alleviates that situation. We can just compress the search key and then instead of decompressing each element of the B tree along the search, I just compare the compressed search key against the elements in the index until I find the row that I need to find in the, uh, in the uh, database table. So again, a feature tailored to um, the types of workloads and the efficiency of running those workloads um, that, that we deal with on the mainframe. Um, let me wrap this up. Um, Processor chip with um, very large caches and, and, and an S system control chip with um, an even larger cache. Uh, designed in 14 nanometers. Um, the CP chip has uh, about 6 billion transistors. The system control chip about um, 10 billion transistors. I think I mentioned before that it's running at uh, 5.2 gigahertz. With the topology in a fully built out machine with uh, four drawers, 
you end up with uh, 200 physical, 240 physical cores. Um, we do have a, a, a system where we use some of those cores for I.O. acceleration, system assist processors, et cetera. So of those 240, 170 can be configured by customers for the various types of processors that we um, provide. You can either have uh, uh, Linux processors or ZOS processors. They are physically and electrically, et cetera, uh, the same. They just get handled slightly differently in the firmware, and uh, software pricing and hardware pricing around it is different. Um, and we have a lot of microarchitectural enhancements and architectural enhancements for a very wide variety of workloads that we're running. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, you know, I spent the first 20 plus years of my career working on mainframes, and I have a very soft spot for them. And it's fairly clear that uh, IBM still knows, knows how to build really fast machines. Um, you know, I haven't looked at the latest spec benchmarks, and I was totally unsuccessful in getting my speakers in the session to provide good comparative benchmark numbers, but I'd really love to, to get, you know, one of these uh, chips lined up against the best from Intel and AMD and, uh, and see what happened. I think if you guys would generate workstations, uh, you know, it would be really interesting to uh, swap out my uh, Dell PC running uh, Linux with uh, something from you guys. At least... It, 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 Especially it, at the same price. <laughs> it, it, it's probably worse for your bank account and you have, your office is going to get warmer. Wait, sorry, what? <laughs> You. Your office is going to get slightly warmer. Oh, yes, yeah. Well, there is the air conditioning issue. Um, <laughs> but, okay, so anyway, we have questions. Um, I guess since the spotlight is on Nathan, uh, Nathan Brookwood, go ahead. A uh, couple of questions. Uh, by the way, you have to adjust for price performance when you compare with the Intel and uh, other processors. Uh, mm. That was not a question. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you talked about uh, 5 gigahertz, which is pretty awesome. Uh, what kind of power do these chips require? And is this still air-cooled, or are we going back to liquid cooling? So um, you can pretty much get those chips to run at any power consumption that you want to. You can essentially dial it in. If you run an extremely high-power workload, you can get those into four or 500 watts. On a typical workload, um, they are more in the 3 to 350 watts. Um, we we um, don't bin, right? We're selling the same system to all the customers and don't have the situation where, um, you know, some chips are less power and run higher frequency and we sell them at a different price point than, you know, the, the slower chips. We don't do that. So what we do is we pick the chips so that at the drawer level, we stay within the bounds of what the drawer power is. And that ends up being about in that ballpark, three to 350 per chip um, in the draw. And are you doing air cooling or liquid cooling? Um, so the chips themselves are water cooled. There's a closed water loop in the draw, in, in the machine that, that runs cold water over the cold plates. And then there's two options that customers have. They can either have a um, air cooled system that takes that closed water loop and blows heat into the data center, or you can hook up um, data center water, um, which is often more efficient, obviously. Mm -hmm. And one other question, you talk, in talking about your protected key cryptography, uh, you said that the protected key resides in a PCI card. And, you know, I was really happy when you talked about how you could do cryptography for everything with hardly any performance penalty. But if you have to go over the PCI bus to get the key each time, doesn't that sort of slow things up? Yeah. So. It's the master key that sits in the PCI card, and then the uh, key token that the application sees is the actual key wrapped with that master key. And we've got a firmware layer that interacts between software and hardware, and that firmware layer goes and gets the master, uh, sends the protected key down and uh, decrypts the protected key and then uses that in the hardware for the decryption. It can actually keep a handful of those unwrapped keys in a small buffer that is not software accessible. It's part of the lockdown firmware. So and so that way, we don't have to go back and forth to the PCI card. Great. Thank you. OK, thank you. Next. Andy Glue. Um, the uh, protected keys, or the wrapped, unwrapped protected keys, in some ways, 
have you considered doing something like Intel SGX with, uh, you know, protected application domain protected by encryption inside the processor so it doesn't have to go out to the uh, PCI? Well, and so, so that it could be used for more than just the crypto that you're doing. Yeah, so that, that comparison is, is not really apples and apples, right? There's a, um, the, the temper resistance of the card is a, is a very significant part of, of storing the wrapped key there. Uh, and the protected key, like okay, I said. Okay, okay, I just have to break in, by the way. DEF CON has a, ta a tamper evident and tamper resistant village, and we would really love to have one of your cards or even a few of them, and we'll see how hard it is to break in. Okay. <laughs> Um, we're the guys, DEF CON is the guys who broke into the voting machines, and uh, there's people who do, do this for fun, believe it or not. Uh, no, I, no go, going down, yes, tamper-resistant, but again, you can wrap an Intel CPU in tamper-resistant, Intel just doesn't do it, but the key is the encrypted mode of execution. You know, uh, SGX prevents somebody with a logic analyzer from going in and seeing what's happening. Yeah, that's true. Um, what one goal for us is we, we do this at a uh, level that doesn't require application changes. And there's such a number of applications and lines of code and everything out there that if you try to rewrite those to adjust to a different crypto scheme, it would be unbearable to our customers to do that. So, you so the uh, protected key algorithm that we have is essentially a transparent way of never giving the key to the application and having it sit in application memory without the application actually needing to change for that. You encrypt okay, all well, I.O., uh, well, but you don't encrypt... Yeah, you need to wrap it up because we have a couple more questions we need to go on. So can you cut, cut it to like 10 seconds? Do you encrypt in DRAM or is it typically unencrypted in DRAM? Oh, the, the main memory is not encrypted. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I recognize this guy, uh, Dave Patterson. Um, uh, I, probably uh, you wouldn't be giving away secrets uh, if you could, uh, to, to other competitors, if you could say, what would you do to make COBOL run faster? Because <laughs> it's, it's an understudied topic. Well, I'll give you the example of what we've actually done. We've recognized that um, COBOL spends a lot of time doing VCD arithmetic. Decimal is the bread and butter data type in COBOL. And uh, we did have uh, VCD instructions from 1964 all the way back but they were accessing for both operands the cache data and then storing the result right back into cache. Uh, as you can imagine, that puts a lot of pressure on load queue, store queue, out of order, store conflicts, all the, all the stuff that you know, we've all studied for, for many years. So what we're doing now is we added instructions that use the 16-byte wide SIMD registers to store packed BCD data in there and perform BCD arithmetic right on that data, not going through the caches. Um, are the, COBOL, po COBOL programs smaller because they're so old, or are they uh, also stress the cache? Um, each program in itself may be smaller, but the, the sheer amount of programs, the, 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 type, the, the thousands of types of transactions running through the system pretty much every second put an enormous stress on the, uh, on the instruction front end. Thank you. Okay, one very quick question, yeah, and then well, we have to move to the next three speaker. Numbers comparing the new system with the old, 35% capacity increase, 10% single thread, 25% SMT2. Could you explain what the capacity meant and exactly what the SMT2 performance boost means? Yes, so when we, when we say capacity, we mean the um, compute capacity, numbers of instructions per second, or whatever you want to call it, that fits in a drawer and since the old machine and the new machine both have four drawers also, that the whole system as an aggregate can deliver. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, the 10% the is on a, uh, what we call the large scale performance ratio, uh, rating. It's a, it's a uh, benchmark for the types of commercial applications that customers use for, prior, for um, capacity planning and things like that. How many CPUs do I need uh, to run this kind of workload? Uh, that's the 10% single thread performance. Uh, this is the second generation SMT machine, so besides the 10% single thread performance that effectively become immediately an SMT benefit also, uh, we got additional tuning and tweaking on the SMT uh, implementation. And so a single processor that, that runs in SMT mode um, is 25% faster than a processor running in SMT mode from the prior generation. Okay, yeah, that's a significant change. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much. I think that was a fascinating talk. Okay, our next speaker is back to the more conventional world. 
uh, or what is these days. Um, the title of the talk is The Next Generation AMD Enterprise Server Product Architecture. Our speaker is Kevin Lepak. Um, he's a senior fellow at AMD on the server, SOC, and system architecture team. He's been working in the microprocessor industry, mostly at AMD, since receiving his BS, MS, and PhD, and la the latter in 2003, in electrical and computer engineering, all from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He spent the majority of his time on system architecture, SOC architecture, performance power architecture, memory system architecture, th that word is showing up a lot, and related items for the x86 processors, but also spent a few years working on ARM-based SOC designs. Kevin? Thank you. Okay. Sorry. Okay, uh, thank you. So, again, I'm Kevin Leepak. I'm happy on behalf of AMD and the entire design team, as well as my co authors, to talk to you about uh, the AMD Epic server processor. So, this is the obligatory cautionary statement. Let me move on. Okay, so when we set out to design Epic, uh, here were basically the key tenants that we had you know, in designing uh, the this, this server processor system to improve TCO uh, for enterprise and mega data center uh, level customers, right? So the first one was to build on a high performance x86 processor core called Zen. We've talked about it you know, in some detail in a number of forums. We also added uh, virtualization, RAS, and security features. And I'll talk some about you know, a number of these throughout the rest of the talk. We also wanted to maximize the per socket cap uh, capability of the, of the system, so of, our, of the platform investment in AMD. And we did that through an MCM architecture, which I'll talk about in some detail as we move forward over the next 25 minutes or so. Um, we have a strong fabric interconnect or infinity fabric interconnect, and I'll say more about that in terms of our bandwidth balance and various other things. Very strong memory capacity and bandwidth capability. Very strong I.O. subsystem, in particular, a uh, very strong 1PIO subsystem, but we also allow 2P uh, processors or two socket systems all, as well, and also an integrated server controller hub uh, for a true single socket capable design. Um, <clears throat> we have a number of power features, and some of which I'll be able to talk about. Uh, in the interest of time, unfortunately, I won't be able to cover everything here, and this slide kind of highlights what I can. Uh, we have a number of these materials that I can't talk about that were released through our social media team as part of the uh, Epic Tech Day material, and I refer you to you know, that material for some additional information if you're really interested in learning more about Epic. Okay, so one of the things that you need to build a strong server processor, of course, is a strong CPU core. I'm not the, I'm not the CPU core guy. I have uh, my, my colleague, Mike Clark, who presented at Hot Chips last year to introduce you to Zen. Uh, the Epic processor makes use of Zen. You know, and it's a totally new high-performance core design uh, with simultaneous multi-threading support and is implemented in an efficient FinFET process technology. Some specific things that are of interest, you know, in Zen and the server market, right, are the things that are listed here, right? So we support data poisoning, uh, interrupt virtualization, that's the AVIC feature, uh, nested virtualization, some specific memory encryption features, you know, which um, the previous speaker talked about, our spin on it's a little bit different, but it's the same you know, kind of basic principle, uh, and PTE coalescing. In terms of microarchitecture features, you know, we've reduced world switch latency. Uh, we have a very tightly coupled L2 and L3 cache architecture uh, for basically modern uh, virtual machine sizes for the scale out data center. And we also have cache and memory topology reporting for hypervisor and OS scheduling. So the Zen Core was built to service multiple markets. It has a strong, very strong enterprise, uh, data, uh, enterprise and data center feature set. Okay, so let me talk a little bit more about some of the security features that we have uh, inside of Epic. So this first one is secure memory encryption, and it's really built as an encryption engine that sits in front of our memory controllers in the system, and it can encrypt uh, all of the traffic that goes to DRAM in the system, and it's really a layer of physical security for, uh, for traffic stored in memory, right? So you can do this either transparently, right, or you can do it with the operating system or hypervisor informed of which pages to encrypt and which ones not to encrypt. But the key thing is that the key is not known to either the operating system or the hypervisor. It's only known to our platform security processor, and it's the one that manages the key and loads it into our microarchitecture. So this gives us defense against unauthorized access to memory. 
One of the follow-on things we do with it is called SEV, or Secure Encrypted Virtualization. Okay, so it's built on top of, I'll call it the same physical security substrate that I just described, but the, ta the, the take on it's a little bit different, right? So in this case, you know, you're running in the modern you know, hyper, uh, cloud data center. You don't necessarily know who's running next to you. Uh, you, know, you don't necessarily own the hypervisor that's been provided, right? But you still want to protect um, your operating system image and application data. Right, and that's basically what we're doing with SEV. Okay, so we leverage the same physical security substrate, um, but we allow the guests to be encrypted, right? <clears throat> and that key is not known to the hypervisor or to the guest, right? And when we, uh, when we do that, even though the hypervisor can access all of physical memory because it can map anything it wants to, since it doesn't have access to the key, it can read the data, but it can't interpret it, right? So that's a really key, you know, way uh, that we've approached this and it allows you to do it with no application modifications, right? So a uh, hypervisor or operating system potential modifications to be enlightened about what's going on, but no particular application modifications. Okay, so uh, reliability, availability, and serviceability. Okay, so our caches are protected with SecDead and DeckTed. Uh, we have you know, a, a strong DRAM, RAS feature set there. I won't walk through everything there in detail. We support data poisoning and machine check recovery platform first air handling, and as well as uh, infinity fabric link, uh, you know, packet CRC and retry for availability. A little bit on data poisoning on the right-hand side, I think some other folks have talked about it, so I'll just do it quickly. But uh, in the, in the right-hand side of the slide, you know, there's a core or a thread that's accessing memory that's working perfectly well, and he can be effectively isolated in terms of the fault zone from the different core, which is labeled core A here, that's touching uh, a memory location that has an uncorrectable error. Right, so when that happens, you know, we can treat that as a separate, uh, separate zone. It can be reflected up to the application. You know, the OS can handle it. The hypervisor can shut down you know, the, the virtual machine and map the page out. There's a various number of things that can be done. But we've implemented a strong enterprise RAS feature set uh, in Epic. OK, so one of the things that we get asked a lot about you know, uh, as AMD and the way we approach this versus some other ways of having done it is, you know, well, why the MCM architecture, right? So, and I want to spend a little bit more time you know, woven throughout the next 10 minutes or so you know, saying some more about that because we get lots of questions about it. OK, so on the right-hand side of the picture is basically what our uh, topology looks like inside the package. So sorry. Let me... So basically, there's four identical die in here, right? And each one has two DRAM channels, uh, four within package or die to die infinity fabric links. That's these things in green. Uh, two 16 lane high speed series links. That's these in orange, right? And then again, four die all the way around here. The CCX is our core cache complex. So that's really four cores with private L2s and a shared L3, right? And there's two of those per die. Um, <clears throat> The main thing to note here, for example, is that we have four infinity fabric links for die to die within here, but we only connect three of them to get our fully connected network, right? And the reason that we have four is just to get the package topological uh, routing to work right, to give us the, you know, the speed and the signal integrity that we're looking for. But there's only three enabled uh, on any particular die. It's just different, potentially different three, okay? Um, Again, we have two SIRTIs per die to the pins. Uh, half, you know, one per die goes to the top, one per die goes to the bottom. And the links are labeled with different letters, but the numbers correspond to which die they're coming from. And part of the reason we do that is so when this is hooked up in a two processor system, um, we connect G links to G links in the second processor. And that means that each one of the PCI Express ports is effectively serviced by a single die, and that gives us superior uh, system capability. And then again, you know, two DRAM channels per die connected to the pins. Uh, on the bottom left-hand part of the slide, I just give you a little bit of a key of the things that I walked through, right? But the key point here is that this is really a purpose-built MCM architecture, right? And it was very intentional in the way we approached the design. Okay, so, you know, in, 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 as a way to further illustrate that point a little bit, uh, I do a hypothetical comparison here of what we implemented, which is this picture on the right-hand side, right, versus having built a monolithic, you know, large die SCM, right? So the MCM approach has a number of advantages. It lets us have higher yield and an increased feature set, right? And it also gives us multiple product leverage, right? So if you've been following AMD, you know that this design is kind of leveraged into other places in AMD's roadmap, and that's done directly, 
right? And that gives us you know, a lot of uh, leverage out of one silicon design. Okay, so in the Epic processors, there's four 213 square millimeter dies. That's 850-ish you know, square millimeters of silicon in the socket. If we had done this as a large monolithic uh, die, we would have ended up at 777 square millimeters, right? And that's about a 10% area overhead. So you compute that by pulling off these customized MCM links, right, and various other things that are only, you know, used out of one die in the socket. So for example, the integrated server controller hub, we only need one of those, but each die's got one. So the other three are removed in this computation. I think what some folks find surprising is maybe that this overhead is as low as it is. And part of the reason we, you know, how we pulled that off was to intentionally design it this way, right? So in, as a lot of folks know, there's an inverse exponential rela uh, relationship between die size and yield uh, for fully functional dies. And on the bottom part of the slide, I'm talking about that. So uh, of course, this is done with our proprietary internal models of costing, but it's using our production cost models. Um, so I can't give you all the details of exactly where this came from. But if we said the, the single monolithic die you know, cost a unit of one in terms of silicon cost, then when we split it up into the four dies the way I described it here, that's actually 0.59x. Or if you flip this around and make this one, basically this cost is 1.7x, right? So that it gives us this MCM approach, it gives us higher yields, it increases our ability to do you know, more peak compute, and we can deliver the full feature set you know, basically across our entire roadmap. Okay, so a little bit more on the Infinity Fabric architecture. Uh, it gives us our substrate for innovation, both in the control fabric and data fabric. Um, you know, our, I think for folks who saw the uh, Radeon Vega talk from my colleagues yesterday, they talked some about this as well. But this is really leveraged across AMD's entire product portfolio as we go forward. Um, in the interest of time, I'm only going to be able to spend a little bit of time on the data fabric today. But again, there's, there's other material available online if you're interested. So first on the memory subsystem, so again, eight DRAM channels per socket, two DIMMs per channel. Uh, our maximum speed in this product is 2667 megatransfers per second, which gives us a peak theoretical bandwidth of 171 gigabytes per second. We've measured uh, 145 running stream triad, so that's 85% efficiency. That efficiency is you know, um, achieved bandwidth as measured by the benchmark divided by the pins times the wiggle rate, right? So that's actually a very good achievement you know, at the scale of a system that we have here. Uh, using eight gigabit DRAMs, that's up to two terabytes of capacity per socket, and we support all of the standard uh, server, server DIMM types. Again, now a little bit more back to the die-to-die -die interconnect or the MCM, uh, the MCM discussion. So it's fully connected as I showed within the socket, as I showed you previously, and we've done purpose-built uh, low-power, low-latency MCM links. Each of them is 42 gigabytes a second, and they're about two picojoules per bit in, in TDP. Uh, they use single-ended signaling uh, with a low-power zero transmission in order to optimize you know, the total power uh, in the system. And when they are idle or less utilized, we can borrow that power and give it to the cores to help them run faster and effective frequency, for example. Um, <clears throat> I mentioned that 145 gigabytes per second on the previous slide, uh, but the reason I brought it up here was to talk about it in terms of our bisection bandwidth, right? So we have four links running across the bisection times 42 gigabytes per second is 171, which is actually twice what you need for, to claim that the system is balanced. Okay, and that helps me lead into the picture on the right-hand side, which is really our latency versus load graph, okay? So on the vertical axis is the latency in nanoseconds, and the horizontal, band, uh, the horizontal uh, axis is kind of requested bandwidth from the system. There are three lines here that I label NUMA-friendly in green, NUMA-typical in red, and NUMA-unaware in blue, right? And of course, on the left-hand side of the graph, you can see you know, depending on how uh, memory is mapped, you pay you know, a latency penalty, which people understand. Um, but as we move to the right and we increase the offered load in the system, you know, the separation between these stays relatively constant, right? And that's a, a, a testament to the fact that we have you know, provisioned appropriately you know, in this architecture to provide scalability, right? So if you look at the saturated bandwidth you know, for the NUMA unaware case, which is really a single core targeting all four dies uniformly, right, versus the NUMA-friendly case, which is 100% local, uh, and NUMA-typical is 75% local and 25% spread around. You, know, you can see that we're basically within 15% in saturated bandwidth um, you know, when, the, when the system is fully loaded, right, which is a, which is a, really, uh, a really good result. 
OK, so a little bit about the Infinity Data Fabric and the coherent substrate. So it's built on enhanced coherent hypertransport. It's a seven-state coherence protocol. Uh, we use a probe filter or directory, if you're used to it by that name. Uh, it's SRAM-based for minimum indirection latency. And of course, a good coherent substrate is important for performance scaling, right? Uh, in the bottom part of the slide, I talk about you know, different protocol flows. And I need to define the terms a little bit, right? So the requester is a source CCX or you know, a source uh, core cache complex. Um, you know, the home is the, where the coherence controller sits. That's basically co-located with, um, with the memory address you know, in DRAM where the memory controller lives. And then, of course, the target is a caching CCX. OK, so excuse me. So if you look at the bottom left-hand side, this is kind of the most common case where the data that's being requested is, is uncached in the system. So we send a request to the home. It does a lookup. It sends a response. That's the blue arrow labeled two. And then there's a dotted line here that's effectively a finalization transaction that isn't in the critical path in terms of load to use latency, but it's carried you know, inside the protocol framework. Um, in this middle case, you know, there's one particular cache that we need to contact. Right, and so we call that a directed probe. So again, a request goes to the home. The home determines there's somebody we need to contact. We call the target. And then the target sends the response back. And then again, there's a finalization transaction. So this is a, it's a standard, it's a three-hot protocol is what we implement internally. OK, so for multicast, it's basically the same flow as I just described. But when there's multiple targets to contact, we don't have to broadcast it throughout the whole system. We can limit it to you know, a, a smaller domain. But otherwise, the, the flow is the same. OK, so we invested a lot in our I.O. subsystem with Epic, and it gives us a lot of unique capabilities. Um, let me start with this picture on the right-hand side. So our, our links are switch-hitting links. That's what I like to call it. So each of the links can be used as infinity fabric or, or our socket-to-socket -socket communication that's shown here in green, uh, or PCI Express with a lot of bifurcation options, or also SATA on some of the links. OK, and that's important in terms of our ability to provide a, a, an outstanding feature set. Um, <clears throat> we can basically bifurcate the PCI Express links you know, uh, in multiple ways, as are shown here. And we have up to eight ports and a single by 16 right, that we can offer uh, our platform partners for them to differentiate. We support PCI Express Gen 3. So that's 32 gigabytes a second you know, per by 16 link and bidirectionally, or 256 gigabytes per second per socket. Uh, of course, a number of advanced PCI Express features, I won't walk through all of them, uh, and integrated SATA support. OK, and I mentioned at the bottom of the slide, you know, we architected for massive I.O. systems. And this is an example of that. And I think uh, my colleagues also showed you this yesterday, right? So up to 128 PCI Express links per processor. And we, we can use them all for I.O., which really gives us a unique uh, 1P story uh, with Epic of up to 128 PCI Express links, all from a single processor. So you don't have to populate the second processor uh, to get the full capability of the system. It's one I.O one I.O. hub per die or four per processor. We have PCI Express peer-to-peer -peer support and a large number of cores, as well as you know, DRAM bandwidth and capacity, right? That gives us you know, a very strong single processor solution. One of the questions that we get you know, about that, about replacing PCI Express switches in the system or building this call, I'll call it collapsed PCI Express subsystem is. OK, you can do that, but um, have you provided me the same you know, performance uh, characteristics as you know, building a system with external PCI Express switches and things like that? And that's really what I'm talking about at the top right part of the slide. Uh, I only show this for a single device um, to help illustrate the point, but our internal scalability is very good in this area, right? So what I'm showing here basically is for a single by 16 PCI Express port, when it's doing DMA, so that's accesses to, to memory, to DRAM, right, or peer-to-peer -peer write transactions, uh, what type of bandwidth it can achieve. And then here, this is to local DRAM, so a device attached to a given die and then accessing memory on that die. And then here is one hop away within the socket. So I'm at, uh, the device is you know, attached to one die, and the memory or the other device that it's touching is attached through another die. So it's going through the die-to-die -die infinity fabric links. Okay. And you basically see that we achieve 70, 70, uh, 70 to 80 percent efficiency to local memory, very similar efficiency going through one hop to another die, and then also for peer-to-peer -peer write transactions, you know, very high efficiency as well, right? So we've really architected a very strong PCIe framework. 
On the bottom part of the slide, I'm talking about total IOPS in a storage situation. We're achieving basically 285,000 IOPS per core uh, in a one piece system, or 9.2 million IOPS total at the socket level, which is a very compelling achievement. Okay, so a little bit more on some power features. So it's what we call performance determinism and power determinism. So silicon varies when we manufacture it, right? And, uh, and also system environments vary, right? So, and one thing that some of our customers ask us is when you buy a specific OPN or SKU, so from us like an Epic 7601, some customers want it to all behave the same way, you know, even if the silicon is a little bit faster or slower or it leaks more or et cetera, et cetera, and we call that performance determinism. Okay, and some customers want the parts to run that way because they have a particular HPC application or a particular service level agreement level of performance. And when we do that, we optimize the power of each part independently, and that's basically shown uh, in this graph right here, right, depending on the, on the silicon variation underneath. We also have an alternate mode where customers just want us to give them the highest performance that we know how to do, and we call that power determinism mode, and that's represented in this graph at the bottom. Right, so when folks run in that mode, we give them higher performance per part, right? And you can choose which of those you want in Epic at boot time. We also allow configurable TDP. We have three different TDP ranges that are shown here, and you can configure the part up or down you know, to achieve higher performance, to improve you know, performance per watt or what have you. Oh, sorry. Okay, so another important power feature that we have in a large core count multi-chip module system is to use a, a, linear and a, a, a linear voltage regulator. So if we have to set the voltage to the requirement for the worst core in the system, of course, you know, that holds the, the, the power up of the system. But there's an opportunity to optimize underneath that if you can give each core independent voltage, right? So we have a linear regulator built in that lets us take at least one V out of the V squared part of power, and that allows us to optimize you know, the power of the system uh, you know, better than, than not having a step of internal regulation. So that's something in a very large core count system that's important to optimize performance per watt. Hello. OK. So um, <clears throat> how, this is kind of the payoff of everything. So um, there's a lot of data on this slide. This is presented versus Broadwell. I think you're going to see data for Skylake versus Broadwell on the next talk. So although that's a little bit of apples and oranges, it gives you a rough flavor of what's going on. When we designed Epic, uh, we knew that we weren't competing against Broadwell, but this is what we, we could publish for you oh, in time to make it for hot chips, right? And it gives you a basis for comparison, right? So on the upper right-hand side of the graph, this is really memory bandwidth performance as represented by Stream Triad. Okay, and the, uh, and the Broadwell bar is a 2P Broadwell in both cases, and you see that the Epic 1P system is 24% ahead in delivered stream triad bandwidth. And then we scale up 97% to our 2P system to have 146% advantage you know, versus that setup. Uh, on the bottom part of the slide, I'm talking about delivered application performance as, as reference to spec int rate and spec FP rate. Uh, in the top part of the, the slide, I'm talking about optimizing compilers in both cases. So the AMD data is based on uh, the Open64 compiler, right? And the Intel data is based on ICC. And you see that for the integer workloads, you know, we have a 25 to 32 percent advantage, and for the FP workloads, it's 59 to 66 percent. When we normalize the compiler, you know, the compiler component, and just turn it into a hardware comparison, we have a 47 percent advantage, and that's really what's shown at the bottom here. Okay, so Epic processors have a de have deliver compelling performance and memory bandwidth for scalability. So it's been my, my pleasure to introduce you today to the Epic 7000 series processor. Uh, it's been architected for enterprise and data center server TCO optimization. It has up to 32 high performance Zen cores, four, DRAM, uh, four DDR4 channels with up to two terabytes of memory capacity per CPU. 128 PCI Express lanes, a dedicated security subsystem, an integrated chipset for a, a true one chip, chip solution, and it'll be socket compatible with next generation Epic processors as well. And again, as I mentioned, if you're interested in a little bit more uh, technical material on Epic, I refer you to our, um, you know, some of our social media content that will give you a little bit deeper dive on a number of things. Appreciate your attention, and thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, 
This is kind of like the uh, Super Bowl. You know, we've got the uh, two big players in the x86 space, and we get one, and then the other side gets to come on in a couple of minutes. Um, okay. Na Nathan, you know, have, have you got a reservation for that spot? I've um, chosen a seat <laughs> carefully, Alan. Uh, or, you know, I know possession is nine-tenths of the law, but... Right. Um, two questions. Uh, first, we've had a lot of conversations here today about uh, what the right approach is for uh, silicon interposers versus organic substrates and the like. Can you tell us why AMD decided to go with an organic substrate instead of a silicon interposer, since you knew all along that you were going to be doing this fork chip kind of uh, aggregation to get your server product? Yeah, sure. It's a, it's a good question. So uh, I think we, for our high performance server products, I think the, the MCM strategy, you know, I'll call it in the traditional packaging method, is uh, well known you know, in terms of technical, technical executability as well as its, its cost, right? And I think that's, that's really kind of the summary of the answer to your question. So you, do you feel you sacrificed any performance by going with the organic as opposed to a silicon um, deposit? You, you know, I would say that the trade-offs of what, you know, what can be done you know, were articulated well earlier. I think you know, it's, it's AMD's belief, at least for this generation of products, that this technology was, was more mature and a, and a known quantity, right? And there were uh, you know, some trade-offs there, but we think that they were appropriate. Okay. And then second question, and then I'll... Sit down, I promise. Um, you talked about the secure virtualization and the secure memory and uh, how you integrated uh, the AES engine with the memory controller. But what happens if a virtual machine is trying to access memory that is not directly attached to the chip but may be attached to a different chip in that four chip complex? How does the other memory controller know which key to use. Oh, sure, sure. Okay, so, so the key itself, I think I understand your question. So the key itself uh, is resident across all the memory in the system and it's shared amongst the coherent substrate. The key is, the key is loaded in securely and then held in each memory controller. And, and an ID of which key to use is transmitted with each request, you know, but the key itself is not transmitted with each request. Okay. So basically the memory requests have to tag which VM, so they know which key to use at the remote memory control? Uh, well, it's not based on VM, because we, you, not all VMs have to be encrypted, but spiritually, what you described is the right way of thinking about it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Really okay, and please introduce yourself. Yeah, Eric Quinnell, Samsung. Hi, Kevin, how's it going? Hey. Um, so, uh, you may not be able to answer this, but uh, sort of, I had to ask for a techno geek reason. Uh, you encrypt uh, back and forth from DRAM, which is cool from a geek perspective, but uh, as a fabric person, I know that hurts your latency to DRAM. Um, I assume that may be an optional feature, turning that on and off for performance, but uh, my question is, when you do turn it on, I assume an AES round, especially all those rounds to encrypt it, is a, a significant enough latency hit that was that considered in the multicast probing of between clusters? I mean, for instance, you could probe clusters knowing that latency's there and do more speculation than others. So I'm just curious if there's a heuristic Yeah, sure, sure, it's a good, good question. Thanks, Eric. So, um, <clears throat> so the latency for us to do AES-128 is not that long, actually. It's about uh, seven or eight nanoseconds of access time to the DRAM. Uh, and in terms of the way we do the protocol flow, like where you would do you know, an intervention, say, versus getting the data from DRAM, we don't see that delta as being significant enough to drive the fundamentals of the protocol. All right. All right. I think Thanks. that's your question. Yeah, it is. Thanks. Thank you. Um, yes, and, you, and introduce yourself. I'm Trevi Graham from Google. Um, Quick question on L2 and L3. Uh, uh, can you lean sorry, forward step, to the yeah, microphone? We can't hear you. Uh, quick question on the L2 and L3 cache size. Okay. Uh, what, what is it uh, for physical core? Yeah, so uh, 512K byte L2 and then 8 meg you know, shared amongst four cores, L3. 8 meg shared amongst how many cores? Four. Four. So 2 meg per physical core or thread? Uh, 2 meg per physical core, right. Okay. Plus 512K L2, and it's uh, mostly exclusive. So two and a half megs roughly of uh, total footprint per physical Okay, point. and I, I didn't see anything about quality of service uh, parameter or architecture on L3. Is there any way of, you know, partitioning either the cache or the bandwidth? 
Um, I would say that it's done structurally in this generation of processor, right? So uh, we don't have features that correspond to you know, that equivalent technology elsewhere. Um, it's less important for us because of the way we, we structured the chip fundamentally, right? Okay. Um, you know, but that's definitely something we're aware of and you know, tracking when, when appropriate. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, one last quick question. Hi, Charlie Demergent, semi-accurate. Was that monolithic versus uh, multi-die cost comparison, uh, assuming a perfect or at least all cores active, uh, fully functional uh, monolithic? Yes, it was a, that's a comparison of you know, uh, delivering the full feature set in both cases. Um, you know, it wasn't shown in the slide. So 32 core versus 32 core and all the I.O. and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you know, we didn't show it here, but we did a similar comparison if you included, you know, I'll call it harvesting capability. And there's still a significant advantage to the way we approached it, you know, versus the large die monolithic one. Thanks. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, now, now we get to hear the other side. Uh, so our next talk is, the, is entitled The New Intel Xenon Processor Scalable Family, formerly known as Skylake, Skylake SP. Our speaker is Akilesh Kumar of Intel. <clears throat> he's a principal engineer in the data center processor architecture team at Intel, where he's cur currently responsible for the Skylake, S Skylake SP and Cascade Lake processor architectures. He's been at Intel for 21 years, contributing to the architecture of various server processors, chipsets, and system fabrics. He has a PhD in computer science from Texas A&M University. Akilesh? Thank you, Professor Smith. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Akhilesh Kumar, and um, I'm part of the data center processor architecture team at, at Intel. Um, I'll be introducing the new Intel Xeon scalable processor uh, architecture uh, in this talk. My co-authors are Don Soltis, Irma Esmer, Adi Yoaz, and Silas Kotapoli. Um, a processor like uh, Skylake SP is, of course, a, a fruit of uh, labor of thousands of people. So I'm thankful and honored to present uh, Skylake processor to you on their behalf. Notices and disclaimers, as we go through these talks, the, the text gets longer and font gets smaller, so <laughs> bear with us. So, Intel um, Xeon Scalable Processor is the newest uh, processor in the Xeon product portfolio uh, and uh, introduced by Intel uh, just uh, last month. When we started on, um, this journey of, of defining the, uh, the next generation Intel uh, Xeon processor, we had three primary goals. Uh, one is, of course, to improve performance uh, compared to prior generation, and these are workload-driven performance. So look at the data center-specific workload and bring in features in the architecture that specifically target uh, the, the performance for these workloads. The other goal that we had was uh, what are the deployments in the data center? What uh, kind of usages uh, these uh, processors have in the data center? And these are primarily in three different categories, compute, storage, and, uh, and networking. So we wanted to bring in features uh, in the CPU that help across all of these different types of uh, deployments. So um, I'll be talking about some of these features that, that help uh, uh, primarily the compute aspect, but as well as the, the storage and, and networking uh, aspects. And then uh, the third goal we had was to make the, the deployment of these uh, new platforms easier for our customers. So in our prior generation, we had two different platforms uh, for, for data center and uh, different chipsets, different memory capacity, memory, different memory technologies that, uh, uh, that were used across our uh, product line. So one of the goals that we had with, uh, with Skylake and the new platform that we were introducing with, with Skylake was to simplify that for our customers and introduce a unified platform stack that uh, made it easier to deploy and service the needs of, uh, of data center customers. 
And uh, we have tried to achieve all of these goals and architected Skylake CPU to make it efficient, secure, and easy to deploy in the data center. Yeah. <clears throat> I'll primarily be talking about the, the CPU, uh, and we'll go into some of the, uh, the salient features, architectural features of the CPU. Uh, the outline of my talk will be a quick overview of the, of the processor, and then we'll go into the details of the, the major components uh, of the CPU, starting with the core, uh, the interconnect and the CAS hierarchy, the memory subsystem, IO subsystem. And then I'll um, uh, talk about some of the performance uh, results on the CPU, and then we'll conclude. So um, if you uh, look at the feature sets, high-level feature sets uh, of the processor, um, the, the Skylake uh, SP processor, we have made significant changes in the, in the way we have put the, the CPU together. So there are, um, we have brought in, of course, a new core in, in the CPU using the Skylake uh, core microarchitecture. The Skylake core microarchitecture has been in the market for, for some time in our uh, client products. What we have done uh, is taken that base core, made some data center specific changes to that core. And these are primarily in the areas of uh, introduction of uh, Intel AVX 512 instruction set, which improves the, the compute capability of the core to 32 uh, dual precision flops per cycle per core. We have also um, enhanced the, uh, or changed the CAS architecture, the L2 and L3 uh, architecture uh, that is different compared to uh, our CAS architecture in, in our client uh, uh, CPUs. We have redesigned the, the way core CASs memory subsystem and IO subsystem get connected together on the chip, and I'll um, discuss that. Uh, it's a new mesh architecture that, that we are introducing with, uh, with Skylake. Um, there are significant enhancements to memory and IO subsystems as well, and, and we'll talk about that. There is a, a new interconnect between the, uh, the CPU uh, sockets called Intel UltraPath Interconnect, uh, and uh, I'll highlight the, uh, the enhancements that we have done there. And as with any new CPU architecture, we have a whole uh, set of features to enhance the efficiency, the power management features, uh, security features, virtualization features. Um, I will not have the time to go into the details of uh, each of these features, um, but if you have questions, uh, definitely feel free to, uh, to ask. Um, there is one additional um, thing that we're introducing with, with Skylake is the capability to have a CPU with integrated OmniPath fabric, which is uh, deployed in, in a lot of the HPC uh, installations. Uh, so we have uh, a CPU uh, available with, uh, with an integrated OmniPath fabric compatible with the same uh, Skylake platform that can be deployed. If you look at the, the feature set and compare it against the, the prior generation, um, and the, the number of cores have, have increased to up to 28 cores in, in Skylake. Each of the cores is capable of uh, executing two threads of, of execution, so a total of 56 threads uh, per CPU. The LC cache size uh, is up to 38 and a half megabyte uh, per second, and it's a non-inclusive uh, L3 cache size, and I'll uh, talk in more detail about, uh, about that. There are three UPI, uh, up to three UPI interfaces uh, per CPU, running at up to uh, a speed of 10.4 uh, uh, gigatransfers per second. There are 48 uh, PCI Express lanes uh, per CPU, which can be bifurcated into uh, 12 by four, and there are multiple configurations uh, in between that we support. So three by 16, all the way to 12 by four uh, PCI Express uh, connectivity. Uh, from each CPU. Each uh, CPU comes with uh, six DDR channels uh, uh, and running at a speed of up to 2666 uh, DDR4. <clears throat> and the, the TDP of uh, each CPU varies from 70 watts to 205 watts. So depending upon the SKU number of cores uh, and, uh, and the price point, 
uh, the TDP values as well. Now, going to the, the, the core uh, of, the, of the CPU, the core microarchitecture is, uh, is based off of the Skylake uh, core. Um, so it brings in uh, some of the enhancements that we have done in the core uh, in, in the Skylake generation. Uh, these enhancements uh, are throughout the, uh, the pipeline on the front end. There is an improved branch predictor higher uh, throughput decoder, and a, a larger um, instruction window to extract uh, instruction level parallelism. There are improvements in the scheduler execution engine uh, and, and so on. There are uh, enhancements to, uh, to the memory pipeline as well with uh, uh, improvements in, in load store bandwidth and uh, an increased number of buffers for, for outstanding load stores. These have been introduced in the past. Uh, if you look at the last year's uh, hot chips, we have talked about the, the core microarchitecture in more detail. So I won't be going into the details of, uh, of the core uh, more than this. What I would like to highlight is uh, data center specific changes that we have done to the core. So we have taken the base core, added things to it to make it run better uh, with, with data center workloads. So there are two specific enhancements uh, to the core. One is support for um, AVX 512 instructions. These are wider vector instructions that can execute over 512-bit data uh, in each uh, uh, port and uh, in each cycle. And there are two FMAs per core. So this doubles the, uh, the throughput, uh, compute throughput capability uh, of the core compared to prior generation. And that is data center specific. This capability is not available in our our client uh, architectures yet. There is also um, an enhancement to the L2 cache. Uh, so our typical uh, core microarchitectures include 256 kilobytes of, of L2 cache. Uh, for data center workloads, we felt that a larger cache capacity would be useful for these workloads. So we increased the cache capacity of, of L2 by 4x to 1 megabyte of, of L2 cache. So we have taken the base core, enhanced it, and, and using it uh, in our data center CPUs. The biggest uh, core enhancement I mentioned earlier was uh, Intel AVX uh, 512 instruction. Again, this instruction set was introduced in our Xeon Phi uh, processor fam family a couple of years ago, so I will not be going into the details of the instruction set itself. I'll just highlight the, uh, the primary features. Um, uh, as the name suggests, it's, uh, it's a wider vector support with this uh, new instruction set. 512-bit uh, wide vectors are supported. There is an uh, increased number of registers available with this uh, instruction set. So we have increased uh, the, the register count from uh, 16 to 32 operand registers, uh, which effectively quadruples the, the amount of data that is available in registers uh, to be processed. Uh, there are eight mask registers that have been introduced, so you can uh, keep your control flow information separate from, uh, from data and use that to do predicated execution. So uh, these eight 64-bit uh, uh, mask registers uh, are very helpful in, in vectorizing irregular codes and can be widely used across uh, different types of uh, applications. There are additional features such as embedded broadcast, so you can take a scalar data set and use it uh, and apply it uh, uh, across uh, vectors. So uh, having that embedded broadcast capability helps mixing uh, scalar and, and vector data and, and operate on them. And there is uh, embedded rounding capability, so you can specify the rounding modes of a uh, uh, floating point operation with each instruction rather than setting it in a control register and then uh, choosing a rounding mode. So again, um, the, the instruction set uh, itself has been enhanced significantly and is applicable to a wider class of, uh, of workload. And, uh, and we are using it in, in that manner. Uh, we are seeing usage of, of these instructions across a wider variety of workloads. To demonstrate the performance uh, capability that it brings to the core, uh, these charts uh, on the left-hand side is showing you three different parameters. The bars are showing you the uh, the overall throughput for LINPAC workload, what is the gigaflops uh, per second uh, that, that we can achieve using different types of instructions 
on the same Skylake uh, CPU. So as you can see, uh, moving on to, to AVX512 significantly enhances uh, the, the compute uh, capability of, of, uh, of the CPU, uh, almost by 60% or, or so compared to uh, AVX2 instruction set. The other chart, um, other uh, uh, curves on, on that uh, same chart is showing you the, uh, the, the frequency at, of the core at which uh, you're running uh, the core. So moving to AVX2 or AVX512, it's a much more demanding instruction, and we, uh, try, uh, we keep the, the CPU at the same TDP level, so as a result, the frequency drops uh, somewhat uh, as we move to more demanding instruction. But even with that frequency drop, you can see because of the compute density increase, the overall uh, the throughput of the CPU has significantly increased. Now, if you apply this uh, and, and uh, do the, the efficiency metric gigaflops per watt or gigaflops per gigahertz, you again see significant improvement by moving to a denser vector instruction, at least for, for this workload. Moving outside of the core, how the, the, the chip has changed in terms of uh, the connectivity between uh, the, the core caches, uh, memory controllers, and, and I.O. controllers. So in this picture, on the left-hand side, I'm showing you the, you the organization of the, the Broadwell, Broadwell generation of CPU, the prior generation of, of Xeon. There, the cores were organized in four columns, uh, six cores in each column, and it's the 24-core the uh, CPU. And they were connected through uh, two sets of rings uh, uh, across those four columns. And then we had switches at the top and the bottom to uh, allow traffic to go between those two rings. And the memory controller and I controllers were connected to, to these rings as well. That design works fine for that class of CPUs with a certain amount of memory and, and cache bandwidth uh, that, uh, that was supported in that CPU. However, as we move to larger number of cores, increased memory bandwidth, and greater uh, I.O. demand, that design starts to run into uh, to some bottlenecks. So we wanted to remove that bottleneck. We re-architected that uh, interconnect fabric uh, completely to a two-dimensional mesh structure now. So now, again, the, the cores, caches, memory controllers are organized in rows and columns, but now they have dedicated connections going between, uh, on, on each rows and columns and switches at, at each interconnect point. So you, we can follow the shortest path between uh, any producer and consumer, so the latency is smaller, as well as the, the bandwidth or bisection bandwidth that is available between the cores uh, has tremendously improved compared to prior generation. So it has removed some of the bottlenecks that we would have encountered and puts us on a path to continue to scale this architecture going forward. The other major change on the uh, outside of the core that we have done is we have re-architected the, um, the L2 and L3 CAS hierarchy. So again, I'm comparing it against our prior generation architecture. On the left-hand side is showing you the, the CAS organization of, uh, of the Broadwell generation of the CPU, where we had the 256 kilobyte L2 cache backed up by a shared L3, where each L3 cache was organized in a two and a half megabyte cache bank. And there were as many banks as the number of cores on the die. What we did in, uh, in Skylake is we wanted to bring data closer, more data closer to the CPU. Uh, so we imp uh, size up the, the L2 cache to a larger uh, size, uh, increasing that size to uh, to uh, one megabyte L2 cache. It does two things. It brings, uh, reduces the, the effective memory latency to access data, and it also reduces the, the amount of traffic that goes outside of the L2 or outside of the core. So the amount of data transfers happening on the mesh going to the L3 is, is reduced. So the power consumption in moving data around on the chip has been cut down and more of that power budget can be now allocated to the core in doing the compute, rather than waste, wasting that power budget in, in moving data around on the chip. <clears throat> the, one of the side effects of uh, increasing the L2 cache size 
was we had to rethink what our L3 organization would look like. So we had a few choices there. Either we keep the, the L3 organization the same way, uh, uh, inclusive L3, and increase the L3 cast size correspondingly such that we get good hit rate uh, on the L3 cast, uh, even with a larger uh, L2. The other option uh, we considered was, can we improve the efficiency of L3 by moving to a different organization? So what we ended up deciding was to move to a, an L3 uh, organization which is non-inclusive, so it does not necessarily keep the data that is in L2 also resident in, in L3, and make the L3 sizes smaller, but if use it more effectively so that we can get the same misses per instruction uh, characteristics out of that L3 as we were getting in the prior generation. So as a result, we don't have to invest more real estate or more chip area in putting a larger L3 and uh, we can accommodate more cores on the chip uh, by, by doing that, uh, by moving to a, a, a non-inclusive L3 cache. So that's what we ended up doing in, in the Skylake architecture. We moved to a non-inclusive L3 cache, uh, a smaller L3 cache, but, but a non-inclusive cache hierarchy. <clears throat> There's some more details that I'll skip in the interest of time. Uh, here is data to support why this CAS architecture works better uh, compared to, to our prior generation. So what I'm comparing here is our prior generation L2 misses per instruction and L3 misses per instruction compared to what the L2 and L3 misses per instruction characteristics look like on Skylake. And uh, this is for, uh, for using spec int rate workload, different components of spec int rate. And as you can see, Having a larger L2 helps reduce the, uh, the misses out of L2, uh, roughly about 35% on average. And even going to a smaller L3 cache size, but with a more effective uh, L3 cache, we haven't really paid any penalty. Uh, so our misses per instructions from the L3 hasn't increased. So we are, uh, this cache hierarchy works out better uh, in, in the end uh, as a whole. On the memory subsystem side, um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, there are six channels of, uh, of DDR4 on each CPU. They're organized uh, or supported through two memory controllers on each side of, of, of the die. And each of these memory controllers have three channels of DDR4 uh, on, on each controller. And they support uh, speeds of up to 2666, two DIMMs per channel, with a capacity of up to one and a half terabytes. Uh, of, of DRAM uh, per CPU. Moving from four channels to six channels allowed us to, um, to improve the, uh, the memory bandwidth substantially for, uh, for the CPU, and the higher speed uh, helped as well. So we can get effectively uh, about 60% higher memory bandwidth to each, uh, each CPU with this uh, memory subsystem. One of the benefits of going to a, a monolithic die is uh, for, for memory latency, all of the cores on the, on the die get a, a consistent and low memory latency to all, every memory that is attached to, uh, attached to that CPU. So all six channels of CPU, the one and a half terabytes of memory capacity, each core on that die sees similar low latency. Uh, and I'll show you some charts on the, on the next file. We do pay great attention to uh, w what the memory latency characteristics look like. So we make several optimizations to lower memory latency and get very good uh, uh, efficiency on our uh, DDR channels. So we get very high effective, uh, effective bandwidth. Uh, one of the features that we have in, in Skylake is, is a new uh, memory device uh, error detection and recovery capability. I won't have time to go into the details of it, so, um, but there is a, a new feature called uh, uh, adaptive uh, double device data correction capability uh, to recover from uh, memory device errors. Here is a chart uh, showing the, the bandwidth latency profile uh, of uh, Skylake CPU compared against the, uh, the prior generation, Broadwell generation. The Broadwell chart is the orange chart, uh, orange curve that you see on that chart. The, um, as we increase the load, the, the latency goes up somewhat. Uh, 
once you move to, to Skylake with uh, six channels of DDR, of course, the memory bandwidth increases, but the latency also improves, even at the same DDR4 uh, speed across the load range. As we improve the, uh, the DDR4 speed, move from 2400 to 2666, the bandwidth and, and latency improvements uh, are, again, uh, uh, further enhanced. The new um, Intel UltraPath Interconnect uh, was redesigned to improve the efficiency as well as support higher speed so that we can uh, maintain the balance in the system with the higher uh, memory and, and I.O. bandwidth uh, that each of the CPUs support. The integrated I.O. Uh, uh, subsystem has been enhanced as well, so there are several um, uh, there is significant improvement in the uh, I.O. bandwidth that we can sustain uh, on the CPU, as well as new integrated devices, one of them uh, being uh, Intel Volume Management Device. And the function of that device is to allow multiple NVMe devices, uh, SSD devices, to be exposed as a single logical volume. So you don't need uh, an additional host bus adapter to, uh, to be used for that purpose. Here is some data on the, on the I.O. bandwidth performance, uh, and there is, uh, you can see, a significant 60% to 2x improvement in, in various uh, I.O. characteristic commensurate with, uh, with the memory bandwidth improvement. <clears throat> some of the performance benchmarks I'll quickly go through. Uh, here are some uh, data o over a wide range of uh, applications uh, from uh, enterprise, cloud, uh, technical computing, uh, as well as uh, financial uh, services industry. And as you can see, um, there is a significant improvement in performance across a wide variety of workload, anywhere from 33% uh, to, to more than 2x uh, with Skylake compared to prior generation. Some more data points on technical compute workload. Uh, again, with the, the AVX uh, 512 instruction set, higher memory bandwidth, there is uh, significant advantages that, that Skylake brings to, to this class of application. Given that everybody has talked about neural networks, we are in it as well. Uh, Xeon performs very well with, uh, with inference as well as, as training, uh, and we are continuously optimizing our libraries and introducing uh, new capabilities, and you'll see that, uh, 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 that the performance on the Xeon um, workload uh, for this class of workloads is, is quite good as well. So to wrap it up, um, we talked about a uh, lot of these features, uh, various enhancements in how the, the chip is organized and, and how, what value that brings. Uh, let me wrap it up uh, by saying that uh, the, this new class of CPU certainly enables uh, a significant uh, improvement in, in uh, the way uh, the servers get used in data centers, and we are very excited about uh, the, the new way uh, these systems will get deployed and, and open up the, uh, the opportunities for, for data center providers and users. Thank you, and I'll be glad to take uh, questions. Thank you very much. Um, Nathan, I don't see you at the microphone. <laughs> All right, yes, go ahead. Yeah. Hi, Eric Quinnell from Samsung again. Uh, two quick questions. One, you the interconnect, answer what you can. Uh, when you change from the ring to the mesh interconnect, is there still a concept of guaranteed movement, forward progress, or is it allowed to back pressure when endpoints are overflowed? And second quick question is, uh, did you have to change the SNOOP bandwidth uh, requirements of the cores when you went from inclusive to exclusive for higher probes? So the answer to both is yes and yes. OK. <laughs> yes. So, all right. OK, thanks. Um, Nathan, what a surprise. Go ahead. <laughs> you made me do it, Alan. Yeah, I uh, know. That's, that's what most serial killers say. <laughs> <laughs> uh, with regard to your uh, capabilities for neural network uh, performance, have you added anything like 16-bit integer and or floating point uh, operations to speed up the, the neural network performance? No, we have not added that in, in Skylake. Uh, you saw the talk earlier um, yesterday in Knight's Mill, we are doing that, uh, but no, we don't have that capability in Skylake. Thank you. Yep. 
Kevin. Oh, sorry. Okay, I guess we're alternating microphones. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, Rodney Krasinski from NVIDIA. Um, <clears throat> with the non-inclusive L3, how does it work when you have multiple cores sharing read data? Yeah, good question. Uh, one of the details that I skipped uh, in the interest of time is uh, there is a, a snoop filter associated with, uh, with each of the banks of LLC, which is uh, hashed in the same, ma uh, same way that we hash our, our LLC. And that is specifically used to track lines that are present only in L2 and not in L3. So we use that uh, to keep track of lines and, and maintain coherency. So, when, so the, <clears throat> the first time another core references the data, it'll get copied to the L3? That's true, yeah. So the way it would, uh, the flow would work is first time when we bring the, the line from memory onto the chip, it goes to the requesting course L2. But if another core on the same chip requests that line, then we supply that core as well as create a copy in L3 so that other cores, if, if they need that copy line, can, can get it from L3 rather than going to another core. Yeah. Okay, Kevin. Hi, Kevin Creel, Tourist Research. Um, actually, a follow-up on the very first question. Uh, with the new mesh network, I looked at the VTune recommendations. There is a sub-NUMA optimization available Correct. for VTune. Where do, they, where do they perform? Where, what are you trying to do? Cluster? Uh, like right. Yeah, I, I skipped that feature. Um, that was a little too much detail in, in that 20-minute talk. So what that uh, feature um, does is it partitions uh, a large chip into two halves. And you can essentially uh, take advantage of the, the Newman capability built into the operating system in, in memory allocation and localize the addresses uh, and map them to each half of the LLC associated with that memory controller. So you get the localization effect. It reduces latency. It also cuts down the traffic on the, on the interconnect. So you reduce the power uh, that you're spending on the uh, outside of the core and allocate that power back to the core. So it's a performance-enhancing feature that, that uh, we have uh, in, in, in Skylake. Okay, thanks. Sure. Okay, one very quick question. Okay, Stefan Meyer from Apple. Um, when you increased your L2 from 256K to 1 meg, what impact did that have on the load-to-use latency from the L2? You trailed off at the end. All right. Uh, what, what impact did that have on the load-to-use latency from the L2? Good question. Um, so uh, in our uh, prior architecture with 256 kilobyte, uh, our L2 load-to-use latency was 12 cycle. Once we moved to a, a one megabyte L2, that increased from 12 cycles to 14 cycles. So there is a, a, an extra or uh, incremental latency penalty for a larger L2 cache. Thanks. And any comment? I don't know if you can say anything about your data prefetchers, whether there were any changes required with the exclusive L3 organization? No, um, not because of the non-inclusive uh, L3. We did not have to make any changes to the data prefetchers. Thank you. Okay. I think we're out of time for that, so I'm sorry. There's no time for another question. Um, we, our la before I introduce our last uh, speakers, uh, let me point out Uh, let me point out that we'll have some few closing remarks from some combination of our general chair and program chairs uh, after uh, the, the last uh, talk. So please don't rush for the exits. Um, on the other hand, since we have three speakers coming up, if you rush for the exits during that, that's probably okay. Um, so anyway, our, our next talk is the, about the Qualcomm-centric 2400 processor, and the talk is being split between three people, Thomas Spear, Barry Walford, and Dalit Bandarkar. Um, I'll give, give you all three introductions now so I don't have to interrupt them. Uh, Thomas Spear is Chief Archi CPU Architect at Qualcomm. He's one of the initial members of the Qualcomm CPU design team that has produced several generations of ARM-based custom CPUs that have been at the heart of the Snapdragon and Centric product lines. Prior to Qualcomm, he was a member of the Embedded Power PC te design team at IBM. He has an MS in computer engineering, a BS in computer engineering, and a BS in electrical engineering, all from North Carolina State. Our second speaker is going to be Barry Walford, who is Senior Director of Technology at Qualcomm and is the Chief SOC Architect for Qualcomm Data Center Technologies, responsible 
for overall SO server SOC architecture. He has over 25 years of experience in system, SOC, and memory architecture, has a BSEE from Virginia Tech. Prior to joining Qualcomm, he worked at IBM, where his uh, work in spanned embedded power PC, uh, server, and mainframe architectures. Our last speaker is going to be who's going to handle the questions for Qualcomm is Dilip Bandarkar, who reminded me that I've known him since we both graduated, which has been more than 40 years. Uh, we, we were unable to determine quite how we met, but we have known each other for quite a while. He's an IEEE fellow and distinguished alumnus of IIT Bombay. After completing his PhD from Carnegie Mellon in 1973, he's worked at TI, DEC, Intel, Microsoft, and is now VP of Technology at Qualcomm. He's worked on the PDP-11, the VAX, MIPS, Alpha, x86, Itanium, and ARM architectures. And as, as his brag line, he's credited with convincing Intel management to adopt AMD64, but he failed to kill Itanium, <laughs> along with a lot of other people. All right. Re Thomas? I'd like to thank you for staying around. Um, I know it's late on the second day. Uh, hopefully the sugar from the ice cream has kept you awake till this point, uh, but we've got something special for you, so, uh, so sit back and, and enjoy the presentation. Uh, I'm going to borrow a little snippet from the Knights Mill talk yesterday. Uh, we are not at a point that we're going to talk about performance numbers or power numbers. Uh, so if you were waiting around for that, you're going to be disappointed. But what we will do is we're going to give you a, a glimpse into the microarchitecture of the CPU in the Centric 2400 processor. And we're hoping that you guys are going to walk away uh, thinking that this is a, a beefy uh, CPU core uh, that's going to drive Qualcomm into the heart of data centers. Uh, so what we will talk about today is a little bit about Qualcomm data center technologies. We'll talk about the Falcor CPU that's at the heart of the, the Centric 24, and then touch on a few key points of the Centric 2400 server SOC. So why Qualcomm? Uh, the three, three talks before us are IBM, AMD, and, and Intel, all major players in the data center. Well, Qualcomm is now going to be a major player in the data center. Uh, Qualcomm's in the unique position to be able to optimize, uh, build an optimized design for cloud data center technology. We're going to bring over a decade plus of ARM-based CPU architecture experience, both in building custom CPUs, custom SOCs, and also contributing uh, architecture back into the ARM ecosystem. We're going to focus the CPU design now on true server class performance. Uh, this is something uh, that, that we're very proud of, that we've brought out in the CPU, as you'll see going through this. Uh, came as a result of partnering with cloud-based uh, cloud market leaders and, and focusing with internal experts that we've brought in to, to be able to enhance this experience for the cloud. And Qualcomm is uniquely positioned to be able to leverage technology that's driven from the mobile side, uh, specifically in this case, the 10 nanometer node, uh, to be able to lower power, lower area, and, and deliver a, a very robust uh, SOC. So going back about five years ago, uh, Qualcomm Data Center Technology started out with the vision of optimizing a design for the cloud. So what does that mean? Cloud is throughput-oriented. It's, it's concerned about the tail latency, as you heard earlier today uh, from one of the Google Talks. And it's about... It's about building something that will be optimized for a, uh, you know, a VM-hosted environment, uh, distributed uh, computing. But as we've seen in the past, you can't just throw together a bunch of little cores, put 100 plus of them in an SOC, and call it a cloud-based system. You've got to deliver a beefy, a brawny core that has sufficient single-threaded performance that also yields the throughput performance when you put the, put the CPUs together into an SOC. With that said, we're going to dive into a little bit into the Falcor CPU core, which is the CPU that was specifically designed for this cloud-based environment. This is Qualcomm's fifth generation of custom CPU ARM-based design, but it's the first that was truly optimized from the ground up for cloud data center computing. It's fully ARMv8 compliant. There's a few features from ARMv8 or 
8.1 that were pulled in. Uh, ARC 64 only. We have done away completely with 32-bit hardware support. Fully support all the exception levels with Trust Zone and, and hypervisor support, which are both necessary for a cloud environment. Included all of the opt optional crypto acceleration uh, instructions. And again, designed for performance, optimized for power. Now, all of you know that, that one of Qualcomm's strengths is low power. Uh, many of you probably remember the butter test from many, many years ago, right? Uh, Qualcomm is, is synonymous with low power in the mobile space, and we're bringing that technology coupled with the server, the data center performance, and, and providing that now into the, the data center space. We're building a, what we've done is we've built a 48 uh, core SOC, and the heart of that is, is a Falcor duplex, which consists of two cores, an L2 cache, and the ring bus interface. The L2 cache is shared between the two cores, uh, operates about one volt, uh, frequency isn't on the slide, but it operates upward of two gigahertz, and the interface out to the system bus is, is to the Qualcomm system bus interface. Now, this is a proprietary system bus protocol interconnect uh, that was designed specifically to match up with the CPU, the L3, the memory controllers, so the entire system would operate harmoniously uh, to provide a, a thorough, robust, balanced system environment. The shared L2 within the duplex uh, has 128-byte lines and an eight-way cache. It's unified between the I side and the D side. As noted before, it's shared between the two CPUs. Uh, as you would expect in a server environment, it has SecDead ECC support. Uh, it's 15-cycle latency for an L2 hit. It's inclusive of the L1 D caches, so it operates as a, as a snoop filter for the L1s. And there's 32 bytes uh, per interleave, per direction, uh, per cycle, into and out of the L2, both from the CPU quarters beneath and out to the, the QSB uh, interconnect. Uh, now, as noted on the slide, it's, it's, it's 32 bytes per direction per interleave. So the memory system throughout the CPU to the L2 to the interconnect to the L3 is fully interleaved uh, to provide parallel throughput uh, out through the system. Now, uh, some of you have already commented to me this week uh, that the fact that Qualcomm is actually sharing a microarchitectural picture of the pipeline, uh, not something that, that you typically see from Qualcomm, but, but we're excited about this. We want to share it with you guys. So we're going to dive now into the pipeline a little bit. The pipeline is a heterogeneous pipeline uh, providing optimal power per, per unit or performance per unit power. And what do we mean when we say heterogeneous? What we mean is no two of the execution pipelines at the bottom are identical. Uh, each of the, the pipelines, each of the execution units was tuned specifically for its function, and the machine was built strategically to allow uh, certain functions on certain execution units, so, so it's not overbuilt, it's, it's perfectly balanced. It's a four-issue machine with three instructions and one direct branch, and, and just for terminology's sake, uh, issue, is, is we're showing on the picture, is from the expand stage, the orange up at the top, down into the blue, into the rename and the reservation stations in the middle. And then dispatch is down at the bottom from the reservation stations into the ex actual execution pipeline. So we're eight wide dispatch. Uh, as noted before, the, you know, we don't always get up to the eight wide, but, but that way when we're waiting on that long latency load, we're waiting on, on the dependent operations, uh, we can release those instructions from the reservation stations and extract that ILP uh, with the eight dispatch. We're going to walk our way through the pipeline now, starting at the top with branch prediction. And of course, every, every high performance CPU needs a high performance branch predictor. And there's several components to the branch prediction within Falcor. Um, almost all predicted taken branches have a zero to one uh, cycle latency. Uh, it's a 16 entry B tick, which is branch target instruction cache, which actually holds the instructions at the target of the branch. It's a multi level BTAC that's used for indirect uh, or register based branches. Uh, it's a 16 entry level zero BTAC, uh, backed by a 256 entry level one BTAC. Uh, PC relative branches do not need to be held in the BTAC because they use the iCache itself as a BTAC. The iCache encoding support the target address in the instruction cache. There's a 16 entry link stack, and, and for those of you not familiar with ARM, link is the, the link register is what's used for calls and returns. So there's a branch to link, and then a, a, branch, or a branch and link, and then a branch to link uh, for calls and returns. So the 16 entry link stack is specifically used to push and pop call addresses uh, to and from. 
And then there's a multi-level BTAC or BHT that's used for, uh, for conditional branches. And it's a multifaceted table-based approach where there's a series of cascaded tables, each with increasing accuracy. And the design selects the, uh, the table, the result from the table, with the most accuracy. And, and it just slides its way down uh, so that uh, at a given point, uh, one of the tables is always used. Coupled with that branch predictor is, is a robust uh, instruction fetch unit uh, with a novel technique that's been employed in, in some of the CPUs uh, from Qualcomm for a while now with a split L0 and L1 iCache. Now, the L0 iCache is a true iCache. It is not a loop buffer. It's not a micro-op buffer. It's not a microcode cache. It is truly an iCache uh, that is built the same way as the L1 in terms of its decodings and, and what is stored inside of it. The reason for the split cache is the L0 iCache is 24K. It's smaller than the full L1, which is 64K. But the L0 iCache is, is smaller, and so there's less power to access it. Uh, it's, it's zero cycle uh, penalty. So you can access it fast from the pipeline without the power penalty of the larger cache. The L1 iCache that backs it is 64K, uh, fully exclusive. So you, rec you realize the entire 88K of iCache between the two. And the, L L0 I or the L1 iCache is only accessed on L0 miss. And so we only incur the power uh, penalty of the L1 iCache on the L0 miss. The L0 iCache has a very high hit, late, or hit uh, percentage. And so the L1 iCache is only accessed uh, very infrequently. Both caches have full parity with autocorrect uh, in the hardware, so software does not need to be concerned with uh, uh, intervening to handle a parity error in the caches. Four instructions per cycle fetch out of either one of the caches, and the instructions are decoded and fed into the instruction queue as micro-ops, but uh, ARM being generally a risk-like architecture, uh, most of the instructions map directly into a single micro-op. Working our way down the pipeline to the middle part of the pipeline, uh, it's a 256 entry rename and completion buffer and a 76 in entry uh, instruction window. Now, the instruction window is built in a distributed fashion, as you can see on the slides. The only instruction uh, dispatch window that is shared between execution units is the load store. All of the other execution units have an independent uh, instruction dispatch and reservation station. And the reason for that is it's, it's a balanced machine and it's power savings. We don't have to access a very large window uh, to be able to select an instruction for the lower pipelines. It's a fully out of order machine. Uh, direct branches, AOU ops, load store, everything is fully out of order. The loads and stores are reordered down in the load store unit. And there can be up to four instructions retired per cycle. Now, we, again, we need to talk a little bit about terminology here. Uh, Falcor does not have a classic reorder buffer as seen in, in other microarchitectures. Uh, the function of the reorder buffer is performed by a series of structures uh, that all combine to provide the, the necessary features to be able to handle all these instructions out of order. Um, as you see on the slides, there's up to 128 uncommitted instructions in flight. In addition to that, there can be another 70 plus committed instructions in flight. So upwards of 190 instructions can be in flight at any given point in time in the machine. And the retirement, the four retirement uh, per cycle, uh, does not actually get in the way of the machine because, again, the way the CPU is designed, uh, that is not a gating feature. Those instructions that are waiting for retirement are held in a very small uh, instruction uh, uh, structure. And so uh, they can retire over time as the machine keeps executing. Moving down the pipe to the integer and branch execution units. Uh, as you'll see, as we mentioned before, uh, the heterogeneous pipelines, the little table here just gives you an example of, of the way that plays out. Uh, as you notice, uh, there's no, no one of those pipes is identical to the others. Uh, direct branches use the B pipe. Indirect branches can use the Z pipe with simple ALU ops. Simple ALUs can also use in the X and the Y. Multiplies just use the Y, which is why, why the Y is a little bit, or sorry, the X, why the X is a little longer than the Y and the Z. And the pipeline length was specifically based on the size of the operation. So as we traverse down the pipeline, as instructions uh, complete their execution, their operations are forwarded and the instruction is, is written back to the completion buffer. Moving over to the load store unit. It's 128 bits of load, 128 bits of store per cycle, which is matched up with the width of the execution units. There's an L1 data cache uh, that's 32K with a three cycle uh, hit latency. 
It's a write-through data cache, which I know uh, makes a few people squeam in their, or, or squirm in their seats when they hear that. Uh, what's not shown on the picture is a, a novel uh, structure that is built off to the side of the Owen data cache that acts almost like a write-back cache. It, it's a combination of a store buffer, uh, a load fill buffer, and a snoop filter buffer from the L2. And so this structure that sits off on the side gives us all the performance benefit and the power savings of having a write-back cache with, without the need for the L1 data cache to be truly write-back. One of the other novel features about the L1 data cache is a split virtual and physical tag. Uh, every location in the cache has a virtual tag and a physical tag associated with it. And the reason for that is because, uh, as mentioned in, in some of the uh, presentations prior, if you don't have to do a TLB lookup prior to your cache, you can get the data out faster, and you can return the data uh, with better latency. And so loads, as they dispatch, they access the virtual tags in the L1 data cache. They can do that in parallel with their translation, and in some cases, they don't even need address translation. Uh, the, the data is returned from the cache in three cycles, and, and there's no need to go check the physical tags in most cases. Conversely, stores don't need to actual ac access the virtual tags. They need to access the physical tags to make sure that coherency and, and data integrity are maintained. And so stores, when they dispatch, they don't actually even check the tags in the pipeline. The structure that I was mentioning before that sits off on the side of the cache, stores go to that, that structure, and then only one store per cache line goes and accesses the physical tags. Again, a power savings compared to every store lighting up the tags on the data cache. As with the I side, the L1 data cache has full parity with underlying hardware autocorrect, so software does not need to intervene to service a parity error. Uh, coupled to the cell one data cache is a stride-based uh, hardware data prefetch engine that can actually prefetch data to the L1, the L2, and the L3 cache. And it does so in a way that adapts itself to the latencies in the system. And so there's uh, auto adjustments and auto uh, increments and decrements on the multipliers. Uh, has the ability to turn itself off if it detects that uh, it's not effective. And so, so all of that is built down into the, into the CPU hardware where it's close to the instruction stream. Uh, the TLBs inside the Zine, there's a 64-entry L1D TLB that's used for loads and stores in the, uh, in the load store pipelines. Uh, there's a 512-entry final level 2 TLB, a 64-entry non-final level 2 TLB, and a 64-entry stage 2 TLB. Now, what do those terms final, non-final, and stage 2 mean? Those of you that are familiar with the RM architecture will know that in a virtualized environment, there's two stages of translation. Stage one is the guest OS translating from the VA to the intermediate physical address. Stage two is the hypervisor translating from the intermediate physical address to the physical address. A fully final translation goes all the way from a, from a virtual address to a final physical address. The stage two TOB holds just stage two translations from, a, from an IPA to a PA, and that's used uh, to be able to accelerate these table walks that can grow in up to 25 memory accesses with full, fully uh, engaged state or two level translation. The non final TLB holds translations that go from the uh, virtual address to a pointer to the last level table entry to accelerate the table walks in a multi level uh, environment. Now, one of the, the heart, one of the things that make Qualcomm designs uh, unique and, and uh, very attractive is the power management. And so a lot of the technologies that, that Qualcomm has developed in the past have been, have been built into the Falcor CPU from the beginning. Uh, and so what, what's inside the CPU is independent uh, power controls and power gatings for each of the CPUs and the L2 within the duplex. Each CPU is a block head switch and an LDO, uh, low dropout regulator, uh, that, that help uh, either power collapse or reduce the voltage on the shared supply. Now, all the, the L2s and the CPU within the duplex have to be running at the same frequency, but they can independently power gate. So if one CPU is idle, it can go to sleep while the other CPU and the L2 are up and running. Uh, if both CPUs are asleep, the L2 can go to sleep. Uh, full support for coherent, coherency management in the hardware. So if the L2 is going to go to a deep enough sleep, it will auto flush and, and, and main, maintain coherency prior to the collapse. And if the L2 goes into a lighter sleep, it will auto wake on the bus. And so all of this power collapse and these power states are managed by hardware. And there's hardware acceleration techniques that minimize the entry and the exit latency uh, to and from those power states. 
And at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Barry uh, to touch on a few features of the SOC. <clears throat> Thanks, Thomas. So switching gears a bit, uh, the Centric 2400 is a highly integrated SOC. Uh, it targets uh, cloud and throughput oriented workloads uh, using a high core count uh, distributed uh, architecture uh, to maximize concurrency uh, and increase parallelism. Uh, so what you see here is the uh, block diagram of the SOC. Uh, it's intentionally been obfuscated or abstracted, uh, so I'll go through some of the details. Uh, the CPU subsystem has 48 cores, as Thomas mentioned. Uh, the implementation uh, of that configuration is with the duplex, so we have 24 duplexes, uh, each of them uh, with a dedicated interleave set of connections uh, to the segmented ring interconnect, and I'll discuss the uh, segmented ring interconnect uh, uh, in a few moments. Uh, in terms of the last level cache, uh, we have a large uh, distributed L3. Uh, it is shared uh, amongst all of the cores, so all 48 cores have access to that large distributed L3 cache. Uh, there are multiple instances uh, of the L3, uh, each with their dedicated connections to the segmented ring as well. Uh, the addresses, the cacheable memory addresses, cacheable memory space, if you will, uh, are hashed across each of those L3 instances, uh, providing a fully shared L3. Uh, I say large, we're not disclosing the size of the L3 at this time. Uh, in subsequent uh, disclosure uh, on the Century 2400, we'll expose those details, but uh, won't be covering that today. Uh, the architecture of the L3 uh, is neither inclusive nor exclusive. Uh, so we have the full benefit of the L3 cache as well as the L as well as the L2 in terms of our total cache capacity. So uh, the contents of the L2 aren't necessarily duplicated. Uh, in the L3 in the way that they are with an inclusive architecture, for example. Uh, and we also have our points of serialization, uh, or point of coherency, if you will, is implemented within that distributed L3 cache. Uh, so each of those L3 instances can concurrently handle uh, accesses the cacheable memory space, uh, do the lookups, check the L2 snoop filter in each of those uh, um, L3 instances. Uh, enable the parallelism and concurrency of access to, to memory in the cache hierarchy, as, as I mentioned. Uh, for the DDR uh, subsystem, the memory subsystem, we have uh, six DDR controllers. Uh, each of them are independent as well. Uh, so they have independent connections to the segmented ring interconnect, much the same as the L3 uh, and the uh, cores do. Uh, what that does is it allows us to bring the full bandwidth of each memory controller instance back into that ring interconnect and deliver that bandwidth back to the, uh, to the cores in the L3 as well as uh, the I.O. Um, the maximum uh, data rate that we support is 2667 megatransfers per second. Uh, we support registered DIMMs, load reduced DIMMs, uh, one and two DIMM per channel configurations. Uh, and we also have uh, an innovative capability that I'll discuss in one of the subsequent slides uh, called uh, memory bandwidth compression. So that's an inline bandwidth compression that uh, increases our effective throughput for compressible workloads. Uh, in terms of expansion I.O. or platform I.O., we support uh, 32 lanes of uh, PCI Express Gen 3, so that's the uh, 8 gigatransfer per second uh, mode of, of PCI. Uh, we have multiple root port controllers supporting by 16, by 8, uh, and by 4, by 2, by 1 configurations. Uh, in terms of the uh, SOC uh, integration, uh, we have a robust set of peripherals that we've integrated. So we have SATA, DMA, USB, I2C, so basically all of the traditional uh, or historical Southbridge functions that you would normally find in a separate ASIC. Uh, those have all been integrated into the Centric 2400. Uh, allowing us to provide essentially a single chip solution uh, for a platform without the need for a separate ASIC uh, for the uh, Southbridge functionality. So there's uh, platform cost savings, power savings, et cetera, associated with that. Um, the package, uh, so it's a 55 by 55 millimeter socketed LGA, so we do have a socketed solution there uh, for the SOC. Uh, and with that, I'll move on to the uh, you know, the few key features uh, for, for cloud and throughput oriented workloads that we want to highlight today. Uh, so the first one uh, is the L3 quality of service or QoS extensions. Uh, so for virtualization, multi-tenant, multi-instance uh, sort of hosting, 
there's an increased uh, amount of pressure on the system resources. The L3 cache in particular uh, can uh, experience a lot of contention in those situations where you have uh, multiple threads, multiple applications being hosted on multiple cores, all trying to access that large shared L3 cache. Uh, with the QoS extensions that we've added, we basically uh, provide software uh, with a mechanism to monitor the use of the L3 cache. Uh, so that can be uh, beneficial in terms of profiling the workloads uh, and ultimately determining uh, how the L3 uh, should be or could be optimally partitioned. Uh, so those QoS extensions also allow the L3 to be partitioned. Uh, it's way-based partitioning, so our L3, uh, each instance is a 20-way. Uh, set associative cache. Uh, so we have a 256-bit uh, uh, QoS ID that has a 20-bit vector uh, associated with uh, each of the ways of the cache. Uh, so each of those QoS identifiers uh, can be defined uh, in such a way that the partitioning associated with that quality of service domain uh, is uh, essentially configured for the ways that that domain or that quality of service identifier is allowed to access. Uh, so what that allows you to do is basically take what would otherwise be a situation, as you can see in the graphic on the lower left, a um, situation where the cache allocation is primarily uh, a result of the normal replacement policies and allocation policies that would happen concurrently based on the addresses that are being accessed uh, in the system. Uh, when you apply the QoS, you can essentially partition the cache. Uh, and reserve a portion of it for a given physical core, a given, a given VM. Uh, you can constrain the amount of the L3 cache that the I.O. devices, such as PCI, uh, is allowed to access and prevent those I.O. Uh, throughput streams uh, from uh, thrashing the cache. Uh, we also support uh, instruction and data granularity. So uh, you can use the QoS extensions to uh, reserve a portion, half, for example, uh, of the L3 cache for instruction only, for example, and ensure that uh, you know if you have an instruction footprint that can fit within the L3 cache uh, or that portion of the cache or that's accessed frequently, uh, you can essentially guarantee that that stays resonant uh, and doesn't get displaced uh, by I.O. or data accesses from other processes that are running in the system. OK. Uh, the next one is uh, the memory bandwidth compression. So uh, as you're seeing, uh, with uh, Intel, AMD, uh, ourselves, uh, the, the number of cores and threads are increasing. Uh, the amount of memory bandwidth that's needed to feed those cores uh, is increasing. We're seeing uh, increasing number of memory channels. Current generation uh, SOCs are implementing six channels, eight channels. Uh, ever increasing uh, data rates from the memory itself. Uh, but even with that, for certain workloads, there's still not enough bandwidth, right? Uh, so what we have... Uh, implemented in uh, the Centric 2400 is an innovative inline memory bandwidth compression capability. Uh, it's within the memory controller, uh, so accesses uh, writes specifically that go to memory uh, when compression is enabled are checked to see if the line can be compressed uh, from 128 bytes down to 64 bytes, which will save one memory access on a reader or write. Uh, if it can be compressed, we'll store it in memory in that compressed form and save one memory access on the store. Uh, and likewise, on a subsequent read, if you access that compressed line, we will perform one memory access to fetch 64 bytes, decompress it to 128 bytes, transfer it back to the L3 or the requesting L2, um, thereby saving memory accesses, uh, reducing power associated with accessing that memory, and effectively increasing the memory bandwidth uh, that's available to the system. So in a case where you have a uh, bandwidth-intensive compressible workload, uh, our six channels can effectively appear as something greater than six channels in terms of the overall throughput. All right, uh, next one is uh, Secure Boot, uh, which is the final slide. Uh, so Centric 2400 supports uh, a truly secure boot. Uh, so there are essentially three hardware components associated with that. There's an immutable uh, boot ROM, uh, which is uh, an on-chip ROM. It is programmed at manufacturing time, so the instructions are housed on-chip. Uh, the uh, second part of the three uh, hardware components is the security controller and on-chip fuse ROM where uh, customer keys, Qualcomm keys, OEM keys uh, can be stored on chip. Uh, and then the third component is our integrated management controller, which essentially governs the boot process. So uh, if you look at the, the secure boot flow, basically the, uh, the IMC processor boots out of reset. Uh, it fetches its instructions uh, from the on-chip immutable boot ROM 
tamper-proof, essentially, uh, establishing a uh, secure root of trust. Um, that code then loads secondary and tertiary bootloaders, uh, which are signed uh, and authenticated uh, from external uh, spy ROM, for example. Uh, and from there, we load subsequent bootloaders, so UFI and OS bootloaders, which are also authenticated. So we have a, a completely secure process where the initial instructions that are executed come from on-chip, they don't come from off-chip, uh, and all subsequent uh, bootloader codes and OS images and so forth uh, that come from off-chip can be signed and authenticated either with uh, uh, OEM-specific keys or customer-specific key signatures. Okay, so I'm going to turn it over to Delete on the car to uh, wrap it up with a summary. You, you, you heard uh, uh, from two of our, our lead architects, but this represents the work of uh, uh, a few hundred of our colleagues, so I'm going to acknowledge uh, the work that was done by the entire team. Uh, as you may have heard from the introduction, I've been around the block and, I'm so, and, and worked on many chips, but I'm so proud to be part of this team and what they've been able to deliver. So our, our, our status is that uh, uh, this is the first, as you know, a 10 nanometer server processor. It's ARM V8 compatible. We are targeting leading edge performance with absolute leadership in performance per watt. Uh, we've been running uh, different versions of, uh, of Linux and, and, and win Windows Server. Uh, we have a motherboard that you see a picture of uh, that's fully compliant with the Microsoft uh, Project Olympus. Uh, the chip is being sampled at multiple customers, and we should be launching this uh, by the end of the year. So with that, uh, We'll take questions, but before you line up, let me tell you what questions I'm not going to answer. <laughs> <laughs> the, the exact frequency, performance, power, L2, L3 cache sizes, exact launch date, and area. Anything else you can ask. <laughs> okay, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, my, my apologies for... I just for, answered five questions. Yeah, well, I... I um, Actually, those were all the questions I was beating these guys up on when they were preparing their slides, and I kept getting, sorry, we can't talk about that. Yeah. Anyway, my apologies for running over, but we'll take either two or three very quick questions. Um, Fred? I've got two questions, but they're incredibly quick. On okay. your repair for L1 and L0, I'm assuming that's just a refetch on a parity error and therefore not applicable to a, to a dirty data. That's right. And second of all, okay. It's, it's an invalidate with a refetch from with the L2. Refetch, sure. And since the L1 is right through on the D side, uh, then we don't have any But the issues. L2 is, Correct. is yep. at risk. Um, and secondly, with uh, only one load and one store, you seem a little light on loads for any HPC or uh, data read intensive workloads. Is that um, purpose and how significant is that on your scores? So again, you know, we're building a machine optimized for throughput for cloud, and so one load and one store is, is balanced. It's sufficient for uh, for the needs and the of the workloads that we were going after. <clears throat> Hi, Curtis McAllister, Oracle. On the memory compression, if you expect to get a um, compressed. Uh, mm -hmm cache line and you actually end up getting a, an uncompressed cache line, do you incur a latency penalty for doing that? Yeah, so there is a latency penalty. Uh, so you have to refetch uh, or fetch the second half of the line. Uh, I didn't get time to cover it uh, in the uh, presentation, but we actually have an adaptive mechanism, uh, which uh, essentially allows us to monitor the history, if you will, the heuristics of accesses to memory, uh, to monitor how often or how frequently uh, we predict correctly whether it's compressed uh, or uncompressed, right? So we generally speculate compressed, uh, and if we b fall below some threshold, right, a programmable threshold uh, where the majority of the access has become uncompressed, uh, then we'll, we'll start speculate uncompressed and go ahead and fetch the full line size. So that adaptive mechanism helps compensate for uh, the variability that you can occur, incur in some of those cases. Is that memory page-based, oh, okay. or is it? Uh, okay. It, it's We're... not page-based. Okay. okay, next, very quick. Uh, Chris Tilio, UC Berkeley. Uh, you're talking about how you have to crack the ARM V8 to micro ops uh, and how almost all of them map one to one. Could you talk about the ones that don't? And uh, do you, for example, have to crack a load multiple, load multiple increment address? So again, it's ERIC 64 only, right? So we don't have to deal with the multiples. Uh, there's the, the, the load, there, sorry, load pair. Load, load pair. So, so load pair, the uh, load and store pipelines were 128 bits. 
so they can support a single load and extended pair. Uh, so you, you're writing back to two separate registers? Correct. File. Correct. Uh, okay, load, load no, no time. <laughs> Uh, okay. Bill Rash from Intel. I have a question about the Qualcomm system bus. Uh, by my count, I counted 31 stops for 24 core, core duplexes and seven other stops, and it's a unidirectional bus, and that's an awful it's, it's long not, time. It's not for unidirectional, it's bidirectional. It's bidirectional. It's bidirectional. Uh, your diagram only shows a unidirectional. Well, as I said, the diagram is uh, intentionally uh, abstracted, right, obfuscated, as I stated. Uh, the, but I uh, think the slide that talks about the bus says it's uh, uh, bidirectional, and it's the shortest path re re return, so the request goes in one direction, and the response comes. Yeah, I, I moved on given the time, but uh, you know, our segmented ring uh, is... Uh, uh, it's interleaved, so we have even and odd interleaved segments, and each of those segments have clockwise and counterclockwise directions. So we have shortest path routing from any source to any destination, likewise for response from any uh, you know, target back to the, uh, to the requester. Uh, we have a multicast response, so uh, if you uh, miss in the L3, go to a memory controller that is uh, physically close to the core that requested that access, the L2 that requested that access, we can send the response back to uh, the L2 as well as the L3 independently, right, without having to chain it through, uh, for example. Uh, and the segment is essentially a... Uh, well, thank, okay. th thanks for okay. uh, attending, and uh, <laughs> uh, we'll be discussing more, 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 more uh, information over the next few months. We didn't want to kind of uh, say everything. Besides, uh, we had less time than we had uh, information to share. So. Uh, I'm sure you can trap these guys on the way out if you want to ask more questions. Okay, You'll now get we... the same answers, though. Um, I don't know, all three may not give you the same answers. Um, okay, so, okay, here's our, our leadership team, which is going to do closing remarks. And let me congratulate them. For, you know, I, I'm the chair of the steering committee, so I'm the guy who sits in the back seat and periodically yanks the steering wheel, and then they have to fix it. Thank you, Alan. Um, thank you for attending the conference. It's been, a, I think, a success with some little things like the solar glasses. We got them now, but they're pretty useless. <laughs> and, and thank you for staying here. One thing that I want to say is that we have extra water. So you want some small pack of water or something for your drive? So feel free to go up on the place that we have the water before and, and take whatever you want for going home. So less things to pack for us. And thank you for staying from the conference. It's been, a, been a, I think, a successful conference. And I, I'm going to say a few words on behalf of uh, Fred and I, uh, who are joint uh, program chairs. Uh, we thought we had um, really amazing submissions this year, um, very strong, very um, suggestive that hardware is very much alive. Um, and uh, the talks and the presentations, I thought they were very, very strong this year. Um, we really congratulate the, the presenters for the effort they put into the talks and for their technical achievements. And uh, we look forward to seeing your submissions next year and also great new presentations next year and your attendance next year. Thank you. Yes, by the way, we had a huge number of submissions this year, so if you submitted and didn't get in, we, had, we could have taken another 10 or 20 and been happy. So please send us something next year. <laughs>